are you ready for an air show? Airplanes aren't supposed to do that. The Virginia Beach coast is tied to the U.S. Navy like no other region in the country. The Cape Henry Lighthouse still shines today. The Norfolk Shipyard builds, fuels, and repairs the Atlantic fleet. And King Neptune watches over boardwalk visitors. And Naval Air Station Oceana is the Navy's East Coast master jet base, home to the F-A-18 Super Hornets, and today, home to the 2023 NES Oceana Air Show. Hello everyone, welcome to NES Oceana. I'm Ryan Dabrowski. And I'm Brittany Nielsen, and we are thrilled to be your hosts for the NAS Oceana Air Show 2023, where we are celebrating 50 years of women in naval aviation. This year's theme pays tribute to all of our Navy women's trailblazers from the first six to earn their wings of gold in 1973 to the brave women who have since chosen to serve their nation in the skies. Our nation and our Navy is stronger because of their service. In 1973, the first eight women began flight school in Pensacola. And one year later, six of those eight women, titled the first six, earned their wings of gold. In the 50 years since, naval aviation has expanded its roles for women to lead and serve globally. Today, women aviators protect power from the sea and sky. We fly in all strike missions, hunt submarines, protect the integrity of our nuclear triad, supply essential cargo and personnel to every corner of the globe, and rescue those in distress. We command aircraft carriers, carrier air wings, squadrons, and missions to space. In 2023, we reflect on our naval aviation history and pay tribute to all of our women naval aviators. Our nation and our Navy are stronger because of our service. We are 50 years of flight, 50 years of excellence, 50 years of empowerment, 50 years of strength, 50 years of perseverance. 50 years of challenges, 50 years of equal opportunity, 50 years of leadership, 50 years of women in naval aviation. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We have two very special guests with us here at NAS Oceana. Josh Apposito, thank you for joining us, and Dre Buford. Tell us a little bit about your roles. Uh, I am the uh, executive officer here at NAS Oceana, uh, basically the uh, number two in command, and i uh, been here on, on the job for about six months, and uh, Oceana is a very special place. Uh, very happy to be part of this air show, and uh, very happy to be part of this uh, fantastic air base here at uh, the Navy's East Coast Master Jet Base. Yeah, and I'm the command master chief, uh, Dre Buford. I'm, the, uh, I would say, the manpower guy. I don't want to say third in command, but I definitely support the triad, you know, and we uh, do some great things together here at Oceana. Captain, I'll start with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history of NAS Oceana and the strategic importance of the base to the fleet. No, absolutely. Uh, NAS Oceana, we actually just celebrated our 80th birthday just a couple of weeks ago on August 17th. Uh, NAS Oceana was born out of necessity. Uh, World War II, we needed to train more carrier-borne aviators, uh, pilots to fly off of the aircraft carrier uh, to fight World War II. Uh, Norfolk could not handle the uh, massive throughput to uh, generate all the pilots, so Oceana was created out of a bunch of mud flats. Um, they dried out the land, built a couple of runways so they could uh, train more pilots. And uh, eventually, in the 1950s, uh, Oceana became a naval air station and eventually a master jet base. And uh, since the 1940s, we've been training carrier-borne pilots to go out and deploy around the world on aircraft carriers. So to answer your question, strategically, a very significant and important base and uh, proud to be part of the Virginia Beach community. And wow. Command Master Chief, what are your responsibilities as it pertains to the air show that we have this weekend? Oh, great question. Uh, so my responsibilities kind of fall within the manpower thing. So we uh, we have about a thousand volunteers working out here. Wow. Working out here. So uh, basically, what I do is go around to all the different commands and our different uh, tenants, and basically request manpower to come out and help out, and also driving around, uh, helping out with our special needs, getting them to their spots, and you know, uh, working with our uh, volunteers 
to uh, you know keep them around, keep them around uh, while they were out here working and doing such a great job here, at Oceana. Well, it's been incredible. I know Ryan and I have talked about that. Navigating uh, a naval base and navigating during an air show is quite tricky. And I have to tell you, thank you. The service and the uh, hospitality has been truly incredible. Everyone's smiling, and they're excited to be here. So job well done. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to Oceana. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, w I will admit I was a little intimidated coming to a naval base for the first time, and I have no reason to be intimidated. Everyone's been welcoming with open arms, and it's been, it's been truly incredible. Uh, Captain, I got to ask you this question. Obviously, we're, uh, I don't know, a year out from uh, the most recent Top Gun movie, and we're hearing <laughs> the Top Gun anthem being played over the speakers here a whole bunch. You were a Top Gun instructor, I believe. I was, a long time ago. So how? I, the question is, how accurate was the movie to the experience? 100%. Wow. No, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. That's, that's a fantastic question, and I, and I hear it a lot. Uh, obviously, uh, two of the most iconic uh, and fantastic American movies ever made, uh, both the original Top Gun uh, back in the 80s and then uh, uh, the most recent sequel. Um, but uh, Top Gun is a lot of fantastic flying. Uh, out in Fallon, Nevada, out in the high desert, uh, the flying is, is just amazing. Uh, learned a dogfight, and we, we do truly teach the best of the best uh, at Top Gun. Uh, I would say it's a little bit more academic, a little more book learning. I mean, there is absolutely uh, high-end, graduate-level flying, for lack of a better term, uh, but it's a little more academic. They don't, they don't brief in the hangar bay wearing cowboy hats like in the movie necessarily, but, uh, but the flying is, is very, uh, very challenging, and we do, like I said, train the best of the best. So question for you, we talked about the flight line and all the volunteers. Outside of the air show, can you describe some of your uh, responsibilities? Whoa, that's a, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, so outside of the air show, I'm the senior enlisted advisor to the commanding officer and also working alongside with the executive officer uh, with daily base operations and, and emergencies, you know, all type of things. So uh, a lot of times I'm really the morale guy. Right? I love yeah, that. Yeah, I'm really the morale Tell guy. Tell me about the morale. How how do you manage that? Um, well, I really just tell them to step it up and go to work. But <laughs> um, but you know but, you know but on a serious note, on a regular note, no, it's really like so. We got a lot of sailors. We got sailors from all walks of life. So uh, a lot of times for me, I go around and just ask them a question: How are you doing? Um, what can we do better to help you? you know, in your time or to help you do better at your job. So, you know, it's a lot of things, a lot of times with morale, because not every sailor is the same, but every sailor, you know, does want somebody to come up and show some type of interest in them. So that's usually what I do on a, on a day to day. That's the fun part of my job. I yes. love that. We've been talking about that, and I think it's important, the balance between the person and the job, Absolutely. the responsibilities. And thank you for speaking to that. I think that is really important to understand, and it helps them to be probably stronger yes, and does. better in their roles. Yes, it does. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> so speaking of people who are serving here, if someone's considering joining the Navy, what would you tell them? What piece of advice would you give them if they're considering joining the Navy and, and serving our country? Do it. Uh, the Navy, uh, people join for all sorts of different reasons, but uh, I joined to pay for school, uh, which the Navy did for me, um, and I thought I was going to pay back uh, what they gave me for schooling, but here I am 23 years later. Um, it's been an adventure. It's been a fantastic ride, and uh, it's, a, it's a great experience. And whether you join for four years or decide to make a career out of it, um, I'm no recruiter. Uh, but it has been one heck of an experience, and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. If I could go back and do all 23 years over again, I would absolutely do it. And uh, now they let me be the executive officer here at the Navy's Master Jet Base. Uh, next year, uh, if everything goes well, I'll be the commanding officer. And uh, it's, it's really fantastic. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So do it. If you want to join, sign up. And yes, I, and I agree with Exo. You know, he said some great things. Uh, I joined the Navy because I wanted to do something bigger in life. Right. I really want to do something bigger and I want to see the world. So I'll tell anybody who's thinking about joining the Navy, you know, or the military in general is, uh, you know, make make the step. You know, the Navy is a great place. Uh, the Navy, compared to what it was for me 29 years ago, is 10 times better than what it um, for as for sailors and the people. So I would say do it. You know, come to come up. Let's, let's serve together. Love it. So that's, uh, I guess, all the time we have for questions. I just want to say thank you so much. 
for taking the time to interview with us today and chat with us. And thank you again for all the hospitality that you've extended to our crew, the people in the booth, everything. It's been truly incredible and an experience we won't forget for a long time. Yes, please yes. extend our thanks to your entire teams. We Absolutely. appreciate it. We will, and thank you all for being here, uh, joining us as well. We really appreciate you guys, and uh, glad to hear all the high praise for NAS Oceana. Thank <laughs> you. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. So NAS Oceana has put together a spectacular lineup of performers. We're going to see a whole bunch of them. Let's talk about the civilian ones first. We've got the comedy flying of Greg Kuntz. And this is going to be so much fun. You're going to want to stick around and see this because Greg is one of the best of the best, and he has to put on a performance as a novice, an amateur. <laughs> that plane's right next to us here, actually. Aaron Fitzgerald is also here in the Red Bull helicopter. You're going to see a helicopter do things it's not supposed to do. That's right, Ryan. It's going to do full aerobatics, including going upside down. It's totally bonkers. <laughs> Bob Carlton is here in his jet glider that you can see it there in his rocket scientist outfit. He's got a jet powered uh, Super Salto sailplane. We're going to see that do some aerobatics and acrobatics in the sky. Melissa Burns is here. She's uh, flying an Edge 540. The Edge 540, and she will be completing some ribbon cuts for us today. So not only a full aerobatic demonstration, but the ribbon cuts, you're going to want to stick around to see that. Super intense being upside down there. Rob Holland is here. Talk about one of the most accomplished aerobatic pilots in the world. Is that an understatement? No. Overstatement. <laughs> it is right on top of all the high performance, a high energy, and we can't wait to see what he does. I believe we might even get some pyro with his demonstration. Speaking of pyro, we've got the hot streak jet truck, Hayden Prophet, I guess driving that. I was about to say piloting that, but <laughs> driving that, you can see it there. Uh, that is also, you can't have an air show without a jet truck or a jet car, and we're going to see that maybe a little action against Rob Holland. Car versus plane, truck versus plane. It's going to be pretty cool. Place your bets now. It's going to be a hard race, I think. Very intense. Those two are both really competitive, and it's always good to hear their banter of who's going to take it at this at this show. So Sunday's going to be lining up to be a spectacular show. Dude, it's <laughs> going to be a loud, hot explosions America. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> so uh, we talked about Rob Holland there. One of the civilian performances that wowed the crowd yesterday was the aerobatics of Rob Holland in his MXS. I think we've got a little package we can roll for you guys, show you some highlights. Now looking at Rob Holland, you will see competition training at its finest, going knife edge across the sky, entering into a flat spin there, and he jumps right out of a flat spin and continues to go into the maneuvers, rolling the MXS RH through the skies. The greatest thing that I like to say, especially on a broadcast, is that you're really able to capture the crisp, lean lines that he draws with the smoke in the sky, and that really is attributed to the training and the amount of effort and energy he puts in to truly being one of the finest aerobatic pilots. See right there at the end of that snap roll, how he just stops. Yes. That's that crispness that you're talking about. Especially when the smoke is on, we have the smoke off right here coming up over the top. He turns it on just enough to see a double snap. Look at that over the shoulder roll, tumbling in the aircraft. We will see tumbles, we will see rolls, we will see snaps, or what we call flicks. And headed all the way down to the surface and then all these huge verticals that he does. I have a lot of respect for that as a, a general aviation pilot. I don't go vertical like that. I, I like to keep it a little more straight and level. So it's cool to see that for sure. And now you can see how the smoke hangs in the sky. But you'll see the precision as he goes, rolls right and left. Not easy. I tried it one time, Ryan. I was all over the place. And here I thought, they make it look so easy. 
I think it's important for people to know that a lot of these maneuvers, you look at them, particularly in these high performance aircraft, you assume it's just one control input sometimes, maybe with some of the rolls or some of the, the flips and flicks and things you were talking about. <laughs> but a lot of it is you got to work your feet really hard too. And then never mind the throttle, there's a lot going on in the cockpit more than just kind of whipping it over. It really is. You could even see on that when he pulled vertical, how there was a little blip in the smoke, and that's when they hit their line. So during competition flying, unlike air shows, there's a lot of judging that happens. And so the performers and the judges will sit and watch and critique every single line to make sure they're not over-rotated, under-rotated. So those vertical and horizontal lines are really important in the industry. And I love it when it's a, a low wind, minimal wind kind of day, you can really see the lines drawn in the sky. And that move, <laughs> those tumbles, I'm excited to see those today in person because it's something else to watch a plane move in that way. We think about it moving in three dimensions, but it's almost, it's not four dimensional, but <laughs> it feels that way when it's when you're adding that extra rotation. I'm not sure what it's called. You have you done anything like that in your training? Not that extreme. Okay. They keep me to the basics of you know hammerheads and aileron rolls, maybe a barrel roll. So the other thing too, besides being an outstanding aerobatic pilot. He's truly one of the friends in the air show industry, and he really loves giving back uh, to the industry, mentoring others. He's a coach, he's a friend, uh, and he's one that you're certainly gonna wanna follow uh, as we go through NAS Oceana today, celebrating 50 years of women in naval aviation. Sorry, I had a little pause as we have our cadets, our Civil Air Patrol us here. going right behind us. Absolutely incredible. We have so much lined up and really talking about not only the planes, but the performers and so many other people we want to highlight throughout the entire show. Absolutely. We're going to see a lot of amazing things today. You can see things are just starting to kick get kicked off here at Oceana. The crowd's starting to fill in. It's always a challenge to get so many people into an air show space, and it's no different here in Virginia. So we're seeing the, cr the crowd file in for Sunday's performance. Civil Air Patrol cadets with the flags getting ready for the national anthem. And we're also going to see in a little bit the Patriot Riders, which will be a, a really exciting thing to see as well. The, we'll tell you a little bit more about that group when we get to that point in the show. So another civilian performing in just a little while is Aaron Fitzgerald in the Red Bull helicopter. We got a, It's a unique aircraft, and we got a very unique cockpit tour with him. Hi, my name's Aaron Fitzgerald, and I'm the lucky guy that gets to fly the Red Bull helicopter. So come on aboard, and I'll show you how this all works and what it looks like in here. You can see it's a very, very basic panel. This helicopter was built in 1985, so it's not a super modern helicopter, but very well-built, well-engineered, over-engineered helicopter. Uh, the differences between ours and a normal one aren't too many on the inside, except for that we have an accelerometer here, which tells me how many Gs I'm pulling, both on the positive and the negative side. In my display sequence, we don't go negative too much. I go about a quarter of a negative G, so just under zero. You're kind of weightless, kind of loaded in the, in the belts a little bit, but not fully negative. And then we pull about two and a half to two 2.8 on the positive side. So really nothing compared to what guys like Kevin Coleman and, and Rob Holland are flying, uh, but still a lot for a helicopter and it's a ton of fun. Everything else in here is standard instrumentation, just very basic, with the exception of the aerobatic display sequence card. So these are arresty symbols. Uh, those are those are the it's the language of aerobatics, and and my routine starts here and goes back and forth down this line. So each one of these passes represents a pass down the show line. That's just kind of a 
a friendly reminder to me to help keep me in sequence and on time. You'd be surprised how many times you actually look at that. Even though I fly the same sequence every single air show, there's always a point in the show where I look at that to verify where I am in the show. So it's still pretty helpful. One other uh, unusual feature of this helicopter is that we have a smoke system. So we don't have the normal smoke where we pump oil into the exhaust like the um, airplanes all do. We have pyrotechnic smoke. So these are basically smoke grenades that I uh, light with a magnesium match that's fired with an electrical pulse from the panel. Everything in here other than that is pretty standard, except for that I wear a really fancy painted helmet. Most people wear a plain colored one, but not around Red Bull. We wear a fancy ones. And this one has my thing one and thing two on the back to bring me good luck all the time. And that is the inside of the Red Bull helicopter. Now, as you would expect, some of the best military demonstrations are here to perform at the master jet base. You'll see your military's readiness during the air and power demonstration, and they will bring a ton of noise. A ton of noise, a little bit, a lot of bit of explosions. Lots of explosions. Lots of explosions. <laughs> Look at them all just hanging out there. It's Super Hornet after Super Hornet after Super Hornet, and you're going to see them in the sky, and they're going to demonstrate some of the things that they do. You're also going to see the Navy's parachute team, the Leapfrogs. We're going to jump from 8,000 feet and make precision landings. And we're going to have five of the skydivers going today, and we're going to see different flags because they're going to perform twice for us during the air show. F-22 Raptor piloted by Raz is here. And man, you want to talk about loud and angry in all the right ways. And I can't wait to see it. Every time Raz flies and the demo team performs, it puts you on the edge of your seats and you will feel it at home with us live. We've also got the FA-18 Super Hornet Rhino demo team. Really excited to see them. Obviously, they're kind of on their home turf compared to the Air Force team, and they are going to put on an amazing show as well for us today. It's, uh, again, a lot of power. And then, of course, last but not least, your United States Navy Blue Angels will be headlining the show, as it were. And they have been putting on a killer season all season. Brittany, you've been on tour with them and seen them firsthand. Anything people should be looking forward to? It's going to be absolutely incredible. The team has been working so hard. And while I've seen the show a lot this season, it gets me every single time. We cannot wait to bring that to you live in the comforts of your home. And look at, they're right behind us all yeah, look at that. Where is lined it? Yeah, there up. We go. The best backdrop we could possibly have here at NAS Oceana, our U.S. Navy Blue Angels. The, the, uh, the amazing thing about that is that for me is the, the Blue Angel Delta break. Gets me every time. Now, let's talk about the F-22 Raptor. It's one of America's best fighter jets, and it's equivalent to or faster than any other fighter jet in the world. So here's the F-22 going the speed of snot. And then look at the huge verticals it can do. I guess I'm a guy who likes huge verticals. You see that thrust vectoring action that it can do. That's really unique to the F-22. And the whole demo is built, well, it's built around two things. Speed, maybe three things. Speed, afterburner, <laughs> and that showing off that thrust vectoring. And a whole lot of fun, Ryan. The amount of Gs that they're pulling, I mean, it looks... It looks like it would be easy, but you can feel the power and they're pushed back and pulled out all at the same time as they go through. And one of the crowd favorites always is when you capture that afterburner glow. And that's a, a beautiful thing to see. And I think the other thing that people need to notice about this aircraft is how huge it is. If you ever have the opportunity, which will be hard to because of its security clearance status, go stand next to one sometime. They are gigantic. So you're talking about how huge it is. Did you know that it weighs 43,000 pounds, over 43,000 pounds? It is aggressive and it just looks like a threat and I'm so glad it's on our team. <laughs> right? Yeah, that, they call that super maneuverability. Uh, that that'll be demonstrated during the demo today and yeah it's just a super cool thing to see I had the 
privilege of seeing one really up close once under watchful eye of some military police. <laughs> and uh, it's just makes you proud. Makes you proud to stand next to it. It does. And look at, we're giving you just a brief heads up, a fun countdown right now. The U.S. Navy leapfrogs coming up in just about 38 minutes. We're going to turn our eyes to the sky. We're going to point our cameras to the sky. We're going to have the opportunity to see if five of the leapfrogs jump up. The other thing you see in these F-22 demos, and you'll see again today, is the minimum radius turns. Incredible. I mean, turning tighter than some general aviation aircraft that are going much slower can. And then again, those aggressive pushovers. You'll even see today the airplane fly backwards briefly. It does. <laughs> Which we totally didn't think insane. was possible until, you know, they showed it off for us. <laughs> and Raz and team have also uh, been engaged. We may have the opportunity to interview with them well, depending on their schedule. So fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed for that. It would be great. But the other thing is you can also go to Live Air Show TV. We had a logbook uh, where we got to talk to Raz, the pilot of the F-22, and get some inside intel on him as a pilot along with the demonstration team. Look at that angle, there we go. Absolutely incredible. Every once in a while, you can see, even on the canopy, the glare from the sun. Right. So incredible, the stealth-looking fighter. I love the tail, the V-tail of it. There's the... Oh, favorite part. That was part. one of your favorite that parts, That was my right? favorite. I can't wait to see it. I Show me the goods. Open so, it up. I want to see... So for the folks that own <laughs> little vapes on the on the front end of the wings there, for people who may not be familiar, so the F-22 is a stealth fighter, right? So to maintain that stealth profile, it needs to keep all of its weapons inside of it. Can't hang them out on the wing like a, a rhino or something like that. And so that is why those bay doors have to open. So when they want to fire a piece of ordnance, they have to go bloop open, and then the, <laughs> that's the sound it makes. I, I bloop. Just, bloop. It bloops out, and then they can fire the missile or drop the bomb or whatever. So that's why it's so exciting to see because... It's normally a pretty clean aircraft when it flies by. And it feels like you you get a sneak peek. That's why right. I get so excited every time. And you're going to see it. You'll probably have the best view in the house uh, because we're going to get our camera up right close, not too close. But when it goes through and that belly is opened up, I just... Yeah, it's super cool. Speaking of super cool, you could do something super cool for us if you're at home watching it on. That's share this stream. I yes. think you could be watching on a multitude of social platforms. Something like this. You heard it's the Navy's largest open house. And they, our ability to share that with all of you all over the world, really, is a really special thing. So if you have a moment while we gear up and get ready for the leapfrogs in just a little bit uh, to kick off all the live acts, we really would love it if you could share it with all your friends and family. Say, whoa, look at this cool thing. There's this uh, these super nerds, uh, Brittany and Ryan, <laughs> these super <laughs> aviation nerds talking about air show stuff all day. So we would love it, absolutely love it, if you could share that to everybody. It would be a big, a big favor for us if you're viewing it at home. And thank you for those of you who have already tuned in with us and joined us. I know Ryan and I, every once in a while, we'll get the text messages. We see you. Thanks for sharing. So we appreciate uh, the love and support because this is what we do. Uh, we don't get to go to every air show all the time. So it's really important for us uh, to have that opportunity to check in on our friends and our family and see what's happening across the world. And that's why we do what we do. So later today... Those blue jets right behind us are going to perform. It's just one stop on the entire, I mean, they've got a super busy schedule for the blues. Um, how do they go there? How do they get there, those super long distances? It's through something called tanking or mid-air refueling. Looks like we need to just get that teed up for you again. So we will 
show you a little bit about aerial refueling and tanking a little bit later. I can tease it a little bit to say that basically you got to burns a ton of gas. You got to give them gas in the sky, which also seems insane that someone decided that that was a good idea. But we figured <laughs> it out and our armed forces can do it. And all of the Blue Angels have to go up to a tanker in the sky and refuel their airplane mid-flight. Bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolute bonkers. I remember, since we're in the era of Top Gun, uh, as a child playing the Top Gun Nintendo game, and that was the hardest thing you had to do in that game was to try to mid-air refuel. I don't know how much of a nerd that makes me, but <laughs> doing that with three buttons back in the day, we only had three buttons. Go up, go down, speed up, speed down. It was really hard. I threw the controller a lot as a kid. Now, Ryan, this is the first time you and I have worked together. And That's so true. far, I think it's been going really yeah. well. Jury's still uh, out. But Ryan, tell me a little bit more. <laughs> Jury's still out. Tell me a little bit more about your background and how you are where you are now. Well, I am a pilot, uh, a general aviation pilot, a private pilot, tailwheel rated. There's a Piper Cub. I wish you could see it right next to us. You'll see it later when Greg Coots flies. That's what I trained in, actually, a bright yellow Piper Cub. And I've spent a lot of time making aviation content. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that I interview aviators on. And then more, more recently, done a little bit of work here with Live Air Show TV in Yellowstone was a, a great air show to come to. And I also announce for National Stoll, which uh, we're going to talk about Stoll a little bit later today, I think, but uh, short takeoff and landing competition. So I travel the country announcing those aviation motorsport events. What about you? You got to tell us who you are. I will get to that momentarily. But first, let's move on to the next thing. Let's move on to the next thing. So the NAS Oceana Air Show is held annually each September and is the Navy's largest open house with over 300,000 aviation fans coming. We saw a bunch of them here yesterday. Uh, we're going to see more of them today. It's also all the people in the community, the students and families that enjoy this world-class aerial event Yesterday, uh, actually on Friday, over 5,000 local fifth graders came to the base to engage in STEM education opportunities right on the flight line. It was amazing. Every time the announcer, Rick Peterson, would say anything to like, hey, any kids here? It was just this roar of children was absolutely amazing. And everything is gearing up for a great air show. We'll be back right after this. I'm an aviation electrician's mate, airman. My name is Sienna Ahina, and I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii. And what I like about the job is just like the, the diversity and the culture all around. Aviation machinist mate, first class, Tyler Lohr, born and raised here in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And my favorite part about my job is watching these things get to go flying after we work on them. This isn't an audition, or the road trip you took to the coast, and it's far from those weekend camping trips. It's nothing like a district track meet, bagging groceries at the corner store, or crashing a party with your friends. Out here, it's not where the seat takes you, but who it makes you. Get up to a $40,000 bonus when you start today. Resilience, stability, work-life balance. Connecting with sales in the fleet. Pride. It's rewarding. Focuses on diversity and inclusion. Working alongside other veterans. 
the benefits. Welcome back to the 2023 NAS Oceana Air Show Women in Naval Aviation, anchored by the Navy Exchange and MWR. The Virginia Patriot Guard is a diverse group of volunteers with one thing in common. They have a tremendous respect for those who risk their lives every day, whether on American soil or abroad, in securing our nation's freedoms and liberties. They encourage those who share this respect to join them in support of all those who have served. The Patriot Guard has chapters in every state and several overseas posts with a membership of over 300,000. The Virginia Patriot Guard welcomes all to join them. Their only requirement is respect. Patriot Guard riders standing for those who stood for us. Joining the Patriot Guard today are members of the Beachcombers Corvette Club, founded in 1982 and is local to the Virginia Beach area. They have over 100 club member families who are all about the fun and the enjoyment of owning, driving, maintaining, and restoring Corvettes. Through car shows and cruisins, they support local charities like Relay for Life, the Food Bank of Southeastern Virginia, and Sutton Youth Shelters. Standing the flag line before you are Civil Air Patrol cadets from the Virginia Beach's own Coastal Composite Squadron. The Civil Air Patrol is a nonprofit corporation that serves as the official civilian auxiliary of the United States Air Force. CAP volunteers serve America's communities. They save lives, shape futures. Its members selflessly devote their time, energy, and expertise toward the well-being of their communities while also promoting aviation and its related fields through aerospace and STEM education and helping shape future leaders through CAPS Cadet Program. Their core values are integrity, volunteer service, excellence, and respect. Semper Vigilance. Now, right now, we are watching as the Corvettes continue to come in. They are bringing some of our honored guests today that we will be talking about briefly. You can see the motorcycles lining up in front of our Civil Air Patrol cadets. Take a look at the Corvettes. Pretty soon you will see our honored guests. 
out in just a moment. We will be moving into a plaque presentation and we will talk about those that are here being honored at NAS Oceania. Now, Ryan, we were talking about who they are and what they do, but as they were going to us and up uh, right behind the, the booth here, they're waving the smiles, the energy, the crowd was in a roar of cheers as they continue to line up all the way down in front of the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. What an incredible time volunteering to be here to showcase. And like they said, the only requirement, respect. Just heard the call for the uh, Patriot Riders, Patriot Guard to dismount. So they're all dismounting their motorcycles now. And you can see we have a number of family members here too in front of the Patriot Squadron. They're doing this together and they're celebrating as one with all of us. So thank you again if you're joining us this morning here at NAS Oceana. We're just in the middle of the opening ceremonies. And we can see they just had the cue that they can head out of the vehicles. They will again line up for our plaque presentation. And we have a number of people to recognize at the Sunday air show. So the air show's theme and uh, important celebration is about celebrating 50 years of women in naval aviation and we're going to introduce you to a number of important women in naval aviation in just a moment see them standing there first up we'll be talking about lieutenant annie kutchen she graduated cum laude from goucher college in may of 2014 earning a bachelor of art degree in psychology with a secondary academic focus in Spanish language. Annie has accumulated 1,600 plus flight hours in the T-6B, the TH-57, and the MH-60S. She served on the USS Theodore Roosevelt and the USS Chester Nimitz in support of Operation Inherent Resolve and Operation Freedom Sentinel. and bright stars through the perilous fight or oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the Another honoree that you will see soon is HMI Stephanie Higgins is one of seven female search and rescue medical technicians in the U.S. Navy. She started her career at VX31 in China Lake, 
California, where she led several civilian rescues in desert and mountain environments. She then went to HSC 28 here in Norfolk, Virginia, where she was part of the multiple hurricane and disaster relief missions and a deployment on the USS Iwo Jima. and EOD jump team and the world famous United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron, the Blue Angels. Thank you also for our service members and volunteers in support of this Herculean effort. Without them, none of this could happen. We are especially grateful for the presence of our patrons, guests, and other distinguished visitors. This is an incredible opportunity to say thank you to the Hampton Roads community and to see some of America's finest in action. Millions over the years have been thrilled by the feats of daring, the skill, and the precision that we will witness here today. May we all be moved by the rip, the roar, and the rumble of thunder, and all that we observe in the skies above and on the earth below our feet here today. These are the sights and the sounds of freedom. Long may that freedom ring. Again, Eternal Father, we invite your presence here today, and we give you thanks. May your hand of blessing and protection be upon us all. This we ask in your name, the name that is above every other name. Amen. I want to give you a, another brief on another one of the honorees today, Lieutenant Samantha Lynch. Samantha Lynch graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 2014 with a Bachelor of Science in Aeronautical Engineering. She attended flight school in Pensacola, Florida, and her wings of gold in 2016. Sam completed the Fleet Replacement Squadron at HSC-2, where she learned to fly the MH-60S. She was assigned to fly the, uh, she was assigned to HSC-11 for her first sea tour, and while assigned to HSC-11, she deployed with Carrier Air Wing 1 on the USS Harry S. Truman, where they conducted their historic High North deployment to the Arctic, which is the first carrier deployment to the High North since the Cold War. AO to Ariana Richardson, born and raised in Columbia. AO2 Richardson boasts nine years of naval service. With a diverse background, she has served on board two aircraft carriers, three helicopter squadron, and currently serves on board helicopter sea combat squadron 26. Petty Officer Jillian Edwards enlisted in the Navy in 2001 at 17 years old and served eight years active duty. She was among the first female enlisted personnel to report to VF-103 Jolly Rogers, where she earned her plane captain qualification on the last of the big fighters, the legendary F-14 Bravo Tomcat. With CAG-17, Jillian deployed aboard, aboard CVN-73 in support of Operation Enduring Freedom in 2002, and on CV-67 in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2004. And finally, honoring Jamie M. Lynch. Joined the Navy in February of 2016. She proudly enlisted and shipped out of Grand Ledge, Michigan. AO2 Lynch is an aviation ordnance man currently assigned to the HSC2 Fleet Angels. She is in charge of day-to-day ordnance operations at HSC2 Qualifying Fleet, replacement pilots, and aircrew. And let's please celebrate the women and their accomplishments. Ryan, one of the things, too, we didn't mention it, but handing out and recognizing these women in naval aviation was Captain Mary Louise Griffin. And we may have the opportunity to talk to her, but she is one of the trailblazers that we have been acknowledging and talking about today as we celebrate 50 years of women in naval aviation. That's right. She was one of the first six we mentioned in that very first package of the show. And just 
had a little time to spend with her this weekend, and she is just an absolute legend and also totally hilarious. Uh, <laughs> so coming up in 13 minutes and 39 seconds and counting, the U.S. Navy leapfrogs will be in the sky, and we're excited to see that. We're just wrapping up the opening ceremonies of the air show. Something so special as this, there's a lot we have to get through before we can get all the action started. And a round of applause as they acknowledge all of our honorees. Ladies and gentlemen, Melissa Burns is about to take off. And while you can find plenty of pictures of airplane cockpits, cockpits online, we took a tour with Melissa Burns. Take a look. Hey, I'm Melissa Burns, and I fly a high-performance aerobatic display in the Edge 540. Uh, the Edge 540 is a U.S.-built experimental aircraft built just for flying aerobatics. So if you take a look at it, uh, we have one large wing. It's got one big spar going all the way through. This airframe was built to take plus and minus 50 Gs. Now, of course, I can't take that many. So with the engine mounts and all the other systems in here, you'll see my G-meter. We pull about plus and minus 10 G's maximum. In a typical air show, I'll do about plus 10, minus 5, which that's that's good enough for me. Looking at the cockpit here, you'll notice I have kind of a glass cockpit, which is not really common for an aerobatic airplane, but most of the time spent flying around in this airplane is actually doing cross country. So I actually have an autopilot and that helps me with navigating, with reducing my workload and my fatigue and it, it's a it's actually a great safety tool for helping me to fly this plane all over North America, Central America, the Caribbean. Uh, so it's a it's a really great tool uh, thanks to Sarasota Avion along with an engine monitor because what I really want to care about is that engine's doing well when I'm flying over the water, when I'm flying surface level aerobatics, when I'm cutting a ribbon upside down. Having this engine monitor, knowing exactly what's going on in all of those cylinders is extremely, extremely helpful. One other thing to check out, uh, you can see the altimeter. Of course, we can adjust that. Normally, you would set it for mean sea level, but at an air show, we always set it to zero because we want to know how high we are above the ground. Uh, we actually have a special waiver that allows us to do that when, when flying at a show. And uh, yeah, it's kind of a quick little mini tour of the Edge 540 cockpit. And we want to take a moment. We talked briefly about our Civil Air Patrol uh, behind us, but we also have our Sea Cadets. And I want to tell you a little bit, the United States Naval Sea Cadet Corps, the Sea Cadets, is the Navy's youth development program. They give young American skills, knowledge, and confidence through an amazing variety of training opportunities. The Sea Cadets wear uniforms, work as a team in a disciplined environment, and adhere to our core values of honor, respect, commitment, and service. The Sea Cadets are young men and women aged 10 to 18. Wow. They're supported by the U.S. Navy and U.S. Coast Guard, and the cadets train on naval bases and other military installations. And we are so excited. This is the mentoring and the development, both young and old. We are so excited that they are here with us, both the Sea Cadets and our Civil Air Patrol. Absolutely. It's amazing to see how that, uh, how all the folks uh, bringing, you know, children into that. Here's some onboard images now with Melissa Burns. Look, I believe from yesterday or for today. No, it's from today. It's from right now. It's right now. She's so in the sky already. <laughs> she is. She took off. We were so excited about the sea cadets and Civil Air Patrol and honorees. We didn't even capture her taking off because we had a lot of people to highlight. But Melissa is up there right now because, in, as you can see, in about nine minutes and 23 seconds there we go uh, we are going to have our u.s navy leapfrogs there you can see the onboard and melissa in the edge 540 she is going to circle the jumpers which is really a cool thing to see but for the pilots too they watch for the skydivers coming out and they just have to make sure their eyes are on the people and they avoid the people and they just circle it's, around. You make it sound so simple. It's so Brittany. simple. 
But when you think about it, Ryan, our leapfrogs, when I talked to them before, uh, they were getting ready, they were packing their chutes. They're going to be going up, I think today at 9,000 feet. And so they're high in the sky. And when we're standing on the ground, unlike our viewers watching, it's hard to pick them up sometimes. They're just teeny tiny little Absolutely. black dots in the sky. And so when you have the opportunity to have someone like Melissa Burns in the Edge 540 circle with smoke on, it really helps to focus your attention so that you can see them deploy their shoots and you can watch them go through the performance and they fall fast. That's right, they go basically straight down. Straight down. And straight down. <laughs> We're gonna talk a little bit about why they do that in a little bit. But yeah, Melissa Burns in the sky, getting ready to circle those leapfrogs. We're just a few minutes out from that. Again, you can see we've got the Civil Air Patrol and the Sea Cadets going, uh, vacating the flight line from all the opening ceremonies. Um, we're gonna head over to a short little break and then we'll be back here at NES Oceana. Stay tuned. Resilience, stability, work-life balance. Connecting with sales in the fleet. Pride rewarding focuses on diversity and inclusion working alongside other veterans the benefits This isn't an audition, or the road trip you took to the coast. And it's far from those weekend camping trips. It's nothing like a district track meet. Bagging groceries at the corner store, or crashing a party with your friends. Out here, it's not where the sea takes you, but who it makes you. Get up to a $40,000 bonus when you start today. Welcome back to the 2023 NAS Oceana Air Show Women in Naval Aviation, anchored by the Navy Exchange and MWR. Welcome back, everyone. As you can see, our set got full, and I cannot wait for it. Again, celebrating 50 years of women in naval aviation. Ladies, thank you for joining us. Let's take a moment to just do some brief introductions, if you don't mind. Stiggs, do you want to kick it off for us? Hi, I'm Stacey Utech, call sign is Stiggs. Uh, I was started out as an F-14 Rio uh, here at Oceana and then transitioned to the F-18 Super Hornet. Did all my operational tours here at Oceana and I ended up as the commanding officer of VFA-32, the Fighting Swordsman. Fighting Swordsman, we've had the opportunity to see the squadron. So cool, thank you for joining us. Captain? Well, I was uh, had the honor of being here with you yesterday, thank you. I'm Captain Mary Louise Griffin, retired. <laughs> A um, couple of times, and I am pleased to be back on set. I was the 12th woman to receive Wings of Gold, and I'm here representing all of my first sisters, flying sisters who couldn't be here. We've lost four of the first six, sadly, and um, Captain Oslin, Joellen Oslin, our first helicopter pilot, is home in California with COVID, or she would be here with us, and Anna Marie, poor girl, lives on the south of France and doesn't want to come home. I can't understand that, but it's a pleasure to be back with you. Thank you, Captain. Uh, Commander Amy Peterson, I retired out of the reserve, so I was a C-130 pilot, BQ-4. 
uh, came to Oceana. I was stationed here from 88 to 92 and flew the TC-4 back when it was there. Um, retired again out of the reserves and I have a daughter who is a Navy helicopter pilot. She deployed last week and my son is also a Navy helicopter pilot. So oh. all in the family. My husband's a bombardier navigator. So the whole family. That's yeah. incredible. I want to lead with this just because of time. What would you give as advice to both young and maybe not so young to be involved and engaged in not only aviation, but especially for our girls and our women. What's that piece of advice that you can share with us? So the first thing I would say if anyone wants to be part of aviation is don't take no for an answer. Um, I think uh, Mary Louise is a testament to that. Um, but really just go do it. Do what you want to do. You know, if you have a goal, like go for it. And if you run into a roadblock, find a way around it. Um, that's probably the best advice that I could give is just don't take no for an answer. I can echo the don't take no for an answer because I was the, oh, no, you can't do that, girl. So my whole generation. Uh, I think I would always remind women and men, be true to your personal integrity. That is the one thing no one can take away from you. And I would say, again, don't take no. They say, so many people would ask, how can you do this? How did you get to do this? And I said, because you just did. You didn't think. You couldn't do it. There's no reason to not think you could do it. So it's just, it was it was wonderful. Great career, flew, all, it's all I've ever done is fly airplanes, <laughs> my professional career. So yeah, it's, it's, and they can do it. Women are very good at multitasking. That's what aviation is these days, is multitasking, managing the airplane, managing things, and women are very, very good at that. So. Yes, amen. <laughs> Uh, we will we'll be keeping tabs on the time because things are about to kick off, but I want to use a little more time to talk about maybe some of your proudest moments. And there are probably a ton of them, but if you had like a top proudest moment in your career that you'd like to share with us, we'd love to hear that. So genuinely, um, it was actually how I met Mary Louise. Um, I led the Navy's first all-female missing woman flyover for one of her friends, uh, Rosemary Mariner, when she passed away. I was the commanding officer of VFA 32 at the time, and we got to have the honor of, of leading that flyover for her and it was really special and then that's when I got um, in kind of in the group with all these wonderful ladies and trailblazers and for me it was really surreal uh, because I was never told no because of Mary Louise because of Amy and it was just really neat to be able to become part of this this circle of women uh, who made it possible for me what I wanted to do. I wasn't really sure when you first asked that what I would say but all of a sudden it came to me this is my proudest moment. 50 years after Rosemary and Joellen and Chris and Anna Marie and I were commissioned, I am watching my girls <laughs> and my grand girls, <laughs> those young women we just honored out there. Generationally, uh, we have come a long ways, but I will tell you the proudest part of all of that is to see how seamlessly they work with the men, the system, the operation, nothing's perfect on any given day, but it's all we could have asked for. It just makes my heart sing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I would say, personally, the winging ceremonies, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, my dad was able to pin my wings on me. I was able to pin wings on my son, on my daughter. You work hard, doesn't matter if you're male, female, you're, it's you against you when you're earning those wings. And it's, it's pretty cool. So there's nothing like it when you earn your wings of gold. It's a special thing with the Navy and the Naval Aviators. Well, it's ladies, thank you so much. You introed us right into Leapfrogs. Thank you for your service. Uh, and thank you for continuing to blaze the trails for not only our girls, but um, the boys as well. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. It was a thank pleasure. So yeah, thank you. And you can see now the leapfrogs hurtling towards the ground at, I don't know, super fast, <laughs> super fast speed. And we're going to talk a little bit today, we, we do all these parachute jumps, we're going to talk about the differences between high uh, halo jumps and uh, hey-ho jumps. And this, the Navy leapfrogs, is an example of a halo jump that stands for high altitude low opening. And the idea is that if you need to penetrate an enemy uh, position and you, they've got robust air defenses, the aircraft can be above the air defense range 
and the smaller targets, the soldiers who are going to go in to fight, can dive very quickly past all of the uh, air defense range and then deploy their parachutes very low to the ground so that they can get into the enemy position very quickly. Now here's the tandem that you see. I had the chance to talk to the leapfrogs and what happens is one of the jumpers comes out with a tethered, the flag tethered. Now this is 1,500 square feet. And what the leapfrogs told me was that they have to go up and be qualified for this, but it's not based on the number of jumps. It's not the quantity of it, but it's really the quality and the precision. So 1,500 square feet as one of the skydivers jumps, the other one comes through and it's called canopy relative work. And what they do then is tether the other person and carry the flag in tandem and absolutely incredible. As they come down, they do have a precise altitude. We have our first jumper on the ground. I just, I've done skydiving. I did not land on my feet. They are good. <laughs> so that first landing was Senior Chief Ben Pitassi, and I believe second on the ground on the is ground. Chief Nick Ray. And that leaves Chief John Miller now coming in. Touchdown. And then Petty Officer Ansel Scott and Lieutenant Nick Oblitz up in the sky. And with so the flag. they're still tethered right now, spinning. You can almost see their shoots are parallel to the ground right now. That is how steep they are spinning by their ankles at a certain altitude. Again, all of this is briefed. They will break free of that tether and just one of our skydiving members will carry the flag all the way down to the ground. And again, 1,500 square feet, the circles in the sky from Melissa Burns. Now we're gonna wait just a moment as they hold steady and we're gonna watch closely as one of them is about to break. Continuing, they're still up there. Melissa is still circling them. Oh, what an, what an image right there, Ryan. Take a look. Again, up close and personal. We don't see that on the ground right now. So uh, thank you to the amazing camera work. There's the break right now. And that skydiver continuing to carry the flag has an enormous amount of drag right now. The other one's free flying, having fun, doing some pirouettes back down to the ground. Now these Navy leapfrogs, it's the official skydiving and parachute team of the US Navy. Been performing gravity defying demonstrations since all the way back in 1969, and it's comprised of active duty Navy SEALs. So uh, be careful around <laughs> them. Uh, and special warfare combatant craft crewmen, or SWCCs. That flag made a great oh, sound. I'm not it came sure past if you us. were able to hear that, but it was flapping in the wind. Oh, what an incredible jump today. Take a look, again, 1,500 square feet. Now they will take that before the show kicked off. They had that spread out on the tarmac, folded it up and packaged it, uh, which they will do again. So we're gonna see the leapfrogs again later on in the show. And I believe they are going to bring out a special flag. So once again, you'll wanna stick around uh, because Ryan, I don't even know what flag. They kept it a secret from me and they said, we're gonna show you something a little different since we have the ability to jump twice today. So the other person in the sky with them, of course, is Melissa Burns. She's been flying those circles around them. And I'm looking forward to the schedule here. It looks like, assuming all things stay equal, which in air show land, they don't necessarily do, uh, we might see the leapfrogs again right around 120 Eastern. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, Melissa Burns. So she's about to perform a little bit later today. Melissa Burns is about to begin her performance uh, just in a little bit. And we asked her, of all the aerobatic flying that you do, what's your favorite maneuver? My favorite aerobatic maneuver is doing my inverted ribbon cut. 
I love to do, I love any kind of stunt work and mixing it up. So for me, that's just something that's unique and different that I get to get people involved in the ground act and make them a part of the show. So that ribbon cut, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. But first, I think, uh, let's see, teams might be out there. We we had such a great time with Melissa, and we can't wait to tell you all about her and who she is, not only as an aerobatic performer, she's also an airline pilot, and so much more. All right, we just got official word from our air boss. Our air boss at NAS Oceana is none other than Wayne Boggs. And he just said, Melissa Burke, clear to the box. And there she goes, diving into the box, pulling all the energy. <laughs> and I don't know if you heard that, but the pyro has already started going off. There she is at the top, a nice corkscrew in the sky as she does a nice wing over, not a wing over, a hammerhead. You can see the design in the sky. Melissa is a prof. We're gonna bring it up to Rick Peterson in the announcer stand. should hear in just a second that Rick. Hey, you know what, Melissa? Yes, I'm, I'm just watching you. We're getting set up, watching you come in here and get this done. And I thought, now might be a good time to check in to see how you read. I'm going to check the radio one more time, see if she's gone on to discreet as she continues to fly. We hope to have a conversation with Melissa. We have Rick Peterson, our air show announcer here, live on the grounds, trying to get in communication. This often, not often, but sometimes happens in the air show world. Our pilots and performers are juggling between a number of different frequencies, especially on a base. Uh, you will have ground, and let's go. I think we got it worked out. Back we'll to you, Rick. Check in again and see how you read, Melissa. All right, well, it's not working today, but that's all right. She is just amazing to watch fly. Professional aerobatic pilot, display skydiver, former base jumper, wingsuit racer, airline pilot, and mom, Melissa Burns has accomplished so much at a very young age. So watch her fly, and then very shortly, she's going to do a ribbon cut very close to the ground out here in front of us with a few more booms to add to her zoom. Who knows, she might even chase a big smoke ring or two to make it interesting. Melissa Burns. So Melissa Burns, as they sort out that technical issue, loves these onboard. I love these onboard images powered by Naval Exchange and MWR this weekend. Uh, things to watch for one. I mean, whoa! Look Her at that day roll day job: rate. a first officer on the Boeing 737, based in Seattle, Washington, for Alaska Airlines. As a professor for Embry Riddle Aeronautical University, the College of Aviation's graduate department, too. At 22 years of age, she became the youngest female member of the United States Unlimited Aerobatic Team in history, placing third overall in 2015 World Aerobatic Championships after 10 years of competing in the Unlimited World Level. Four-time member of the U.S. Unlimited Aerobatic Team.
Now, Ryan, I don't know if you've had the chance to see, but I quickly turned around over my shoulder and I saw the ribbon crew running out there. They're in orange vests. Uh, it looks like Melissa right now is getting set up. We can see in cockpit. There we go. We have her live to the cockpit. So let's and tune in to Rick and Melissa. Here, You can see right now the ribbon cutting crew on the ground. They have been briefed. They have walked through. And uh, as you see, she's going to be getting set up to do a ribbon cut. Now, we have seen her do it multiple different ways. Uh, sometimes she'll be inverted upside down, just feet above the ground. Uh, and then she will go knife edge and sometimes right side up. The other thing, Ryan, is sometimes she likes to uh, show her skills and go under the ribbons. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's try to go back to Rick and Melissa live in the cockpit. Yeah, Rick, I'm with you if you want it. She's going to get the pole holders to get the the pole's up in the sky here very shortly, and she's going to sever inverted the top one first. At first, she's actually going to fly under them. They've got to get things set up, and this is going to be pretty dramatic, to say the least, as she gets fast and very low to the ground. now and she's going to get lined up and do her first pass again underneath them Flying under it first. Hey, Melissa, it's Rick down here. I've got one more radio we're going to try. How do you read? Hey, Rick, I got you loud and clear this time. Oh, that's so good. You're under it just fine. It's so low to the ground. Now what are you going to do? Hey, I'm going to go do a nice little nice edge toss, toss my pole holders so you guys can see them out there. And uh, then I'll come back the other direction and cut that ribbon I'll let her focus right now. After I cut the ribbon upside down, I'll come back there and get that middle one. If you see there's actually two ribbons slung there, we'll get that one nice edge. I'll give you guys a couple more photo passes and then we'll come around for a landing. But hey, while I've got you on the radio, I would like to take this moment to give a shout out to everyone in the audience. Shout out while you're coming in here too to all of the pool holders and the uh, service men and women that you've got 
chance to meet at I some point this weekend because she is uh, just outstanding. Okay, Melissa, Named and inductee into the Emmy Riddle Aeronautical one. University's Chancellor Hall of Fame in 2015 in Prescott, Arizona. Today she travels with her team performing air show displays and audiences worldwide. Met her husband. You know. Absolutely incredible. You saw her go inverted, got the first one on the first try, and I think we're going to see a little bit more action. She is diving into the box right now. We're staying tuned. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. You heard on the frequency the pyro team there we say, go. we're going to give you a hot one. Look at the flame still continue. Oh, absolutely. The Fire Walkers International Pyro bringing some action to NAS Oceana. And they call that the F-bomb, and we're getting some smoke rings starting to develop in the sky as Melissa gives us a few more photo passes. Again, 18 years on the air show circuit, and as Rick Peterson was saying, Ryan, just calm, collected, and just having a normal conversation like you and I are standing on the ground. Yeah, while she's upside down. <laughs> She's upside down. Now, in just a few moments, we're going to actually talk to one of the members from the Pyro team. I'm really excited about that. Uh, Stacy's going to be joining us here momentarily so we can learn a little bit more about what's happening on the ground and adding more of that entertainment for all of us at the show. Going knife edge. Look at her right now. The head is tilted. Her wingtip just feet off the ground she is a surface level waiver so she can bring the edge 540 all the way down to the ground which is different than when i do it in my cessna because that's just called landing when i do it when i bring it all the way down to the ground it's just a landing but for her it's unless you float a little bit then you could maybe I say i guess i don't know it's a different thing what i do and what she does uh really exciting to watch her fly today and yeah just effortless in the sky especially with that communication here she is landing now it's rolling out now Melissa the other day uh, when we were able to talk to her and interview her we said what do you do to to relax and Ryan, yeah. do you remember what she did <laughs> she's saying Oh, I'm just going to, after this, after we're done at the air show today, I'm going to go for a 10-mile uh, trail run. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to trail run for 10 miles and I'll be ready for tomorrow. <laughs> and she did. She did, yeah. That would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you, and I, you and I went back to the business center in the hotel and did some work and relaxed, and she went for a 10-mile run. Yeah. Yes, That's that is, that probably is why she can talk upside down while flying hundreds of miles an hour. <laughs> so next up, Eric Fitzgerald. Look at that thing. The Red Bull helicopter, VO 105. Now we will see him look at that already doing a loop in the helicopter. Aaron Fitzgerald as an American aerobatic pilot and member of the Flying Bulls from Washington is here with us today in Oceana. He is an ATP rated helicopter pilot with over 9,000 flight hours and is involved with the Flying Bulls and the Red Bull Air Force in the US. That's right. He. Uh... His first flight 
as a passenger was in an airliner, and he really liked that. But his first flight as a pilot was in a Cessna 172 back when he was 15 years old. So, See, Ryan, you have a chance. Yeah, there, I could be like him maybe someday. <laughs> uh, so, so people, I think what's really amazing about Aaron's routine is, I mean, not to be too blunt about it, but it's an air uh, helicopter that goes upside down like that. And people ask him a lot, how does that helicopter do that? And it's all about, he did, we did, I asked him to explain it to a five-year-old who can explain it to me so yes. he can understand it. Uh, <laughs> he said that the rotor system in particular of the BO-105, that design is actually ahead of its time and has proven value to him over the years. That aircraft was designed to do earth flying, which means you know following the train up and down the train for military. That designed to be rigid and handle the negative G's. And so I think the other reason why this helicopter is so great for this sort of routine is that it's just got a ton of power. Power to weight ratio is really high. Uh, you see here on screen too, Aaron flies Blackhawks with the Forest Service battling forest fires. So when he's not doing loop-de-loops and flip-dips <laughs> in a helicopter, he's also uh, being heroic in the uh, in the mountains. And again, Aaron, man, we ambushed him. He came in and he landed and he jumped out and we said, Aaron, we have this great idea. You should interview with us and talk to us and tell us everything about your life and being a pilot in the helicopter and Red Bull. And he was so patient and so gracious. And he said, of course, let me unload the helicopter and I'll jump in and give you whatever you want because that's how dedicated he is. At all the air shows, you will see him walking around talking. Ryan, I absolutely love this. One of, again, my favorite things with the broadcast is you get to see live inside with them as they're maneuvering. So you can see his image, his view, incredible, almost 180 degrees of visibility. And you can see what the helicopter is doing. And for us standing here in person, all we see is that small image there. So this is absolutely incredible. And you can see thing one and thing two as they highlighted for us on the back of his helmet. And that move right there that we just saw, if I'm not mistaken, is the boat turn. The boat turn, and we may have a chance to hear more about that. So what that move was when you saw is when he pitched over, got the aircraft inverted, and then turned a flat spin upside down, and then got himself situated with the, uh, the shiny side up, as they say. <laughs> And we heard Aaron talk about it before, but he has uh, a sequence card in there. So while he flies this routine over and over again, it is something that he will look at and uh, make sure that he is following his sequence. Again, it's about that muscle memory. As you can see right now, we're getting him positioned on the hot ramp. He's gonna be coming in. We might have the chance to see some of our FA-18s down there. Uh, there they are. Take a look at that. I see Fat Albert, I see Fat there. Albert over there too. What a shot. That's incredible. You can see everyone taking the photos. He's lining up, pointing towards the audience right now inside as he sets the Red Bull helicopter down. And I believe we will have a chance to see Aaron in action again later on in the show. Ryan, I do see that we have a couple guests that we may have the chance to interview in just a moment. I talked about it before. We saw the F-bomb go off, the huge explosion. We're going to have uh, Stacy joining us here momentarily. And then early on, we were hoping we had our fingers crossed, but we see it off, off to the side here. Do you see who that is? I just see a light stand, but... <laughs> So let me tell you who's behind the light stand. It's none other than Raz with the F-22. Wow. So if you want some intel, some information, we might be able to pull that out of him uh, today here in just a few moments. So we just saw Aaron's favorite maneuver, uh, the bow turn. Let's hear a little bit more about that in his own words. 
favorite aerobatic maneuver out of all the ones I do is the bow turn, which is where I come into a, a super high nose angle, and then I rotate about 300 degrees on the pitch axis until I'm inverted. And then from the inverted position, I rotate 180 degrees on the yaw axis. Uh, and on that heading, I then rotate another 180 degrees on the pitch axis and fly back out the way I came in. So it's kind of three maneuvers in one, but it's, it's really fun to do if you do it right. And it's hard to do right, so it makes it challenging. It's fun to do it, but it's also a challenge. I'm thinking about it as I enter it. Let's get a good one here. So it's good. That's, my, that's why it's my favorite. Welcome back, everyone. We teased you with it. We had our fingers crossed because, Raz, you are always so busy at air shows. You and your team. Can you tell us a little bit more about who you are? Sure. Uh, Captain Samuel Raz Larson. I'm the F-22 uh, demo pilot and demo team commander, and we're, uh, we're thrilled to be here uh, close to home from Langley, uh, but performing at a great air show here at Oceana. So, Raz, we've uh, been finding out today a lot about all the different performers' favorite maneuvers. And I'm curious, what's your favorite maneuver that we're going to see later today? Uh, my favorite maneuver and our team's favorite maneuver is the dedication pass uh, for the meaning behind it, uh, dedicated to all those who served before us. And then uh, another fun maneuver I love flying is the, uh, the power loop. It's just an interesting dynamic of uh, positive and negative G. And uh, airplanes aren't really supposed to do that, so it's, it's pretty wild in the cockpit getting to fly uh, that maneuver. There's a lot of stuff that airplanes aren't supposed to do that your aircraft does. <laughs> Just thinking about that. What can you tell us? <laughs> yeah, what can you tell us? For, uh, pe for people who don't know the F-22, is there a little bit of a primer they should know about the aircraft? That absolutely. They today? So first, fifth generation fighter. So stealth, super cruise, advanced avionics. And then what we really showcase in the show is the super maneuverability. So we have an extremely advanced flight control system. And that's coupled with thrust vectoring engines. We're the only fighter in the U.S. Uh, inventory that has thrust vectoring. Uh, so that allows us to do a lot of uh, wild maneuvers uh, that you see in the show. Things like a uh, tail slide, a uh, controlled flat spin, uh, the power loops, the backflips. We call it a, a J-turn is uh, akin to a hammerhead turn. And that's all uh, for me flying it. I'm making traditional inputs in the cockpit with stick and pedal. But the flight control computer is figuring out what to move in those extreme angles of attack in order to produce the effect that I'm requesting. Uh, and that allows us to do all that crazy stuff. And when we're at an air show and in a dogfight arena, uh, you really get to appreciate the Raptor for the maneuvering and the thrust that it brings with 70,000 pounds of thrust out of the two uh, F-119 engines. So, Raz, oftentimes we pull in the pilots and we want to talk to all of you, but can you tell us a little bit about your role and the team as a whole because it really is a team effort. Absolutely, absolutely. You only get to see uh, just a small portion of our day in the demo. Uh, our team uh, is about 14 people. We take 10 on the road uh, and they are the very best of their respective disciplines. So crew chiefs, avionics specialists, aircrew flight equipment, public affairs, they're all hand selected to be on this team and that's for a reason. They had a wonderful reputation uh, in their career and they're highly motivated uh, to be on this team. And they, uh, they do some phenomenal things that make, make my job easy. Even just this morning, uh, we were running the jets, uh, making uh, maintenance repairs, so we have two flyable jets this afternoon. Uh, so it's unending work for them at an air show weekend uh, to make sure that we're ready to go. They make miracles happen on the road each and every week, and I appreciate each and every one of them because they are phenomenal. And uh, it's just an honor to get to work with them. That's incredible. One of the questions I have is every demonstration team is a little bit different as far as selection and the time you're in that role. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. Uh, for the flying side, uh, you have to be an instructor pilot in the F-22 to apply for this uh, job. And then it's the typical interviews and paperwork and all those things. Um, and from there, uh, I get to select our two enlisted leaders, so our superintendent and team chief. Again, hand-selected interviews, paperwork, and then we continue that process all the way through every position on the team. Uh, so a lot of interviews and a lot of getting to know uh, the folks who are trying out for the team and getting to know kind of how they did in their previous job. Uh, from there, it's a typical two-year tour. Okay. Option to keep folks for a third. Um, and I'm on a standard two-year tour. I'd love a third if, uh, if I could do it, but we'll see. That's, uh, that's not in my hands. But uh, again, just a phenomenal team and very uh, honored to be a part of it. So you're saying there's a chance. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yep. Talk to me a little bit about your career before the F-22. You said you were an instructor pilot, but what was before that? How, how, what was your path into the uh, Air Force? Uh, so my path got started at a very young age at air shows. Uh, so I grew up in Iowa. 
uh, inspired by my hometown air show. Basically, from the time I had a conscious thought, I wanted to be a pilot. And it was meeting pilots at air shows that kind of illuminated the path forward uh, for me because I didn't have any really military or aviation background in my family. Uh, so that was super helpful for me and had a profound impact on my life. And uh, I thought it was a noble goal to get to serve your country while also getting to fly uh, jets, maybe. So took a risk and went out to the Air Force Academy for college. Uh, that's where I got started, got my four-year degree, got to be a skydiver while I was there, which was a lot of fun, and then went to pilot training thereafter, and after pilot training, uh, went straight to the F-22. Uh, did a, my training at Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida, uh, then a tour in Alaska at Elmendorf, and then uh, went over to Langley. I was in the combat squadrons at Langley for about a year prior to getting picked up for this job. So I've been Raptors basically since pilot training. If someone wants to follow in your footsteps, you, someone's like you watching mm -hmm. today in the audience, a young a uh, boy or girl wants to become a pilot and follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give them? I would say live through your passion of wanting to, uh, to do this someday. And I think it's very, really important to go out in the future and envision yourself accomplishing that goal and then come back to the present and think about things you can do in the short term uh, in order to set yourself up for success. And a lot of times that's uh, hard work and good attitude. Uh, so grades are important. Finding things you enjoy outside of school are very important. Uh, and then it, trying to excel in all those things. And then I always say a good attitude, uh, good work ethic, and humility will get you anywhere you want in life. Uh, so if you apply those principles all throughout all the hurdles you have to get through, uh, then you're going to be successful. So, Raz, this is pretty intense when, what you do, um, and you travel a lot. Can you tell us how do you balance your personal life uh, in this role and in your career? What are, what are some things that you do? Well, it, it helps that we love air shows. So, <laughs> yes. So when we're at an air show every weekend for two months at a time, and fortunate that our team loves air shows as well. So we, we love being here and getting to interact with folks. When we're out at the show, uh, we like to just uh, work on being the closest knit team, team we can be. Uh, it's a lot of family dinners on the road, and then uh, myself and the whole team, you know, we'll we'll make some time for the gym throughout the weekend, and that kind of keeps us balanced. Uh, and then, yep back home for a couple days every once in a while, do the laundry and get back on the road. But it's what we signed up to do and we love it. And we know that this is a fleeting opportunity because our time on this team is finite. So we're trying to just maximize this time uh, on the demo team. And a selfish plug, a lot of times with our demo teams and who are traveling often, we hear from the families with the live broadcast because they get a chance to see you. They don't always get to travel with the team. Uh, so the husbands and wives and children and families uh, get to tune in and they get to see you. Uh, so do you have any shout outs you wanna give? You know, my, uh, my mom really wanted to come out to this show. So if you're watching mom, uh, we're having a great time and uh, hope you can make it to the next show. Oh, Raz, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate Absolutely. it. We know you have to get ready for a demonstration later and we can't wait to see what you bring. All right, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for having you. me. Thanks so much, appreciate it. Now look to the sky. Coming in just at the end there, the EOD team is here. So we were talking before about halo jumps, high altitude, low opening. And today, just now with the EOD team, we're seeing hey ho. <laughs> hey ho, high hey -ho. altitude, high opening. So they open their chutes pretty much after they jump. Uh, which gives them a lot of time to come down to the ground. And they have a lot of stuff on them. Again, this is NAS Oceana's explosive ordnance disposal jumpers to showcase the Navy's elite community. So a little bit different than the leapfrogs. They are highly trained to handle chemical, biological, radiological threats. And one of the things they say is, as Americans, we love the 4th of July, we love the booms, we love the fireworks, but our EOD teams are trying to prevent that the other 364 days. So that high altitude, high opening idea is that, let's say you need to go a long distance under canopy. Mm -hmm. So you do it, what you said, Brittany, you hop out of the aircraft, just you know, nonchalantly hop out. <laughs> pull the chute, and then under canopy, glide a long distance, maybe to a place that you wouldn't normally be able to get to or that an aircraft can't get over. So just a different approach that we're seeing here today with the EOT, EOD team. 
and I'm looking into the sky to see. I think we have them all jumpers accounted for on the ground. Now, one of the things too with EOD um, is that they are they are trained to go in and not throw themselves on explosive devices, but try <laughs> to save all of us. I mean, I have this image in my head. Right. I don't know why. We've all but seen they the go, hurt locker. They go yep. to it. Well, all Absolutely. of us are pretty much unaware of what's happening every day. And they use advanced tools, including robotics and explosive chemistry to make sure that they are disposed of properly. And man, I can't thank them enough. I, I just, I don't know how they are with the fireworks and the pyro, but you and I have been a little jumpy on the set. Yeah, we've been and they're a walking jump. around as, you know, as it, it's normal. So these are the folks that not only are they parachuting in, they're also doing things like underwater mine disposal for the Navy, right? Uh, and they're, they are the people, the men and women that would wear that 70 pound EOD suit. And here's the aircraft that they jumped out of just the, a few moments ago. I think that is the MH-53 coming in, so we'll be able to get a close-up of that and as it comes back in after taking up our EOD team and the leapfrogs. We can see, as we get a little bit tighter here, one of the cool things about this aircraft is it's so big. It is. It's such a big helicopter. It can carry a lot. And the rotors are gigantic. And you can look perfectly on our view right now. You can see the way the rotors actually cone kind of upwards. They bend upwards under the weight of the aircraft. That is uh, that's kind of a special, unique thing to see here. And I'm not sure if we're going to capture it, but Ryan and I are going to be quiet as we listen to the MH-53 go past. There goes the MH-53. We will be back in just a few minutes with a lot more here at NAS Oceana. I'm Yeoman First Class Petty Officer Shelby Ayers. I'm from Newport News, Virginia. And something I like about my job is that the customer service aspect of it. I like being able to help people, something I've always been passionate about. And I like being able to share my administrative knowledge with the rest of the Navy and helping them further their careers. Hi, I'm Yeoman Second Class Jasper de Guzman. I'm from Downey, California. As command security assistant, I take great pleasure in knowing that the sailors of our command's security clearances are always up to date and that security protocols and procedures are being followed in VFA 103. At HP, we leave nothing to chance. That's why we test, retest, and then rethink everything. We follow the little ideas that bring us to bigger ideas. Like when our engineers were admiring the valve system of this percolator which led them to inventing the first ThinkJet printer. Or when that thought led us to a more incredible thought that led us to 3D printing. Or we made the world's first PC that led us to the world's second PC that led us to the 37th and now to a whole new PC that contains motion devices. Because with the innovation of all of us can come from you. Resilience, stability, work-life balance. Connecting with sales in the fleet. Pride. It's rewarding. Focuses on diversity and inclusion. Working alongside other veterans. The benefits.
The Navy Exchange Service Command is with you throughout your military journey, providing the best prices on brands you love, all tax-free, taking care of you with at-ease hospitality, supplying sailors at sea with comforts and essentials, ensuring access to technology, connecting you to family and friends, supporting all who wear the uniform, past, present, and future. Nextcom, our mission is you. Welcome back to NAS Oceana 2023. Again, celebrating 50 years of women in naval aviation. And we are joined right now with Stacy. I talked about this before. Stacy, thank you so much for coming. You are with our Pyro team. So can you tell me just a little bit about who you are and your role on the team? Sure. Um, I'm Stacy Matthews. I'm with uh, Firewalkers. And um, I'm part of the core team, so um, I do a lot of the fueling out there. I take care of the fueling team. Um, we, every shot has fuel on it, so I have my hands on every single shot out there. Whoa. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an interesting role, and sometimes Ryan and I get the question of, how did you get involved? Uh, how did you get involved with Pyro I at know. an air show? <laughs> right? So my dad actually got me into this. He had been doing it for years and years and, um, you know, going out on almost like vacations. And I was like, I got to see what he's doing. <laughs> so one time I'm like, hey, I'm coming with. And I was hooked. <laughs> so then I just kept kept showing up, you know, volunteering and, and learning more and progressing. And yeah, so. <laughs> how, how does the process of setting up a field or an air show for pyro go so it starts um on the wednesday before a show so okay. we all get here on tuesday our travel day we get here wednesday and um we <laughs> start <booms>. yeah <laughs> so we start setting everything up and because what we use is mining explosives and it comes in big quantities so we have to break it down to use it for all of our shots so we do that on wednesday and then we're out here 5 a.m. on show day, just setting it all up. Wow, that's incredible. Now, can you tell me a little bit about, first question I have is the safety side of it. How do you ensure that the team is safe, the crowd is safe, the pilots are safe, because yeah. it is all coordinated. Can you walk yep. me through some of those? Yeah, so we have uh, safety briefs every morning, and um, we're in communication with each other, you know, throughout the day. We have radios. And then our, our boss, Rick Myers, he, he briefs us on the show, and we, we go over it as many times as we need to. And we all know when we're shooting, and we're just eyes up all the time, just making sure we've got our eyes on the plane, and, yeah, very safe. And it is coordinated. So before with Melissa Burns and the ribbon cut, she had the F-bomb yes. go off. It was a huge, massive mm -hmm. explosion. The flames just continued going up. What does that contraption look like on the ground? Can you talk so about that at all? That, that <laughs> is one of our biggest shots. And we've got a huge, almost like refrigerator box, and it's filled with 80 gallons of Whoa. gas and Whoa. a lot <sighs> of debt cord. Whoa. <laughs> yep. So, 80 gallons. A lot of gas. <laughs> and is. you oversee the fueling team. Yep. So you know this yep. precision. Yep. So we got 80 in there and some other detonation stuff. And um, Rick talks to Melissa, and she's ready for it. And he radios us, and we set it off. We actually, I think, heard that coordination a little bit we between did. the two of them. He's like, all right, like, I'm ready to do this. She's like, let me, let my, not that he wouldn't, but let my <laughs> folks with the ribbon cut get off the field and then oh, go yeah. nuts. <laughs> oh, they're far away. We're they a lot are. closer. Yes. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you this because uh, Brittany and I are both a little jumpy. <laughs> We keep getting caught off guard with <laughs> the explosions. We're yeah. like, whoa, wow. The viewers at home might hear just a yelp out yep. of me or you when, when, with that, without much context. Yeah. Uh, does that happen to you still, or are you pretty much no. battle-hardened at because this point? I, I know when they're coming. I've got the schedule, and I can almost, you know, I know the passes, and I'll be like, and we have a lot of volunteers out there that are they're great, and um, they jump, you know. <laughs> but sometimes I try to give them a heads up, and I'll be like, right over there something's coming you know so <laughs> that, that's incredible it must be the muscle memory for jumping 
<laughs> like right. you can you can handle that. Yeah. Now the other thing is, and I hate to ask, but I have to ask. I have this cartoon in my head of you know the box with the handle, this T yes. handle on it, and you go up and you push it down, and it goes boom. Is that real? We have that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We don't we don't always use it. We usually we have some celebrity shooters come out sometimes, and we'll let them use it. Otherwise, think, did you guys have the skipper out yesterday? Um, we had, his, I think his son. Oh, yes, that's cool. So I had, I had him do that. Um, but normally, for us, when we shoot it off, we don't put that big production on. But we use two nine volt batteries, and that's how we set everything off. Do you do like <laughs> I did when I was a kid and just test them on your? That son? is actually one of our safety things. We have to test no. both batteries, <laughs> and then we have to test the leads before we set it off. Yep. See a picture so there's here yeah, the, there's the blasting machine. Is, is that Rick? Yep, sitting that's there? Rick sitting there with the two of our blasting machines. <laughs> Brian, there's two of us. There's two okay. machines. We could just plant that idea. Uh, we'll just yeah, yeah. plant okay. the seed. Yeah, All right. there we go. We can get uh, some good footage, I think. <laughs> talk to me about the most challenging part of your job. I think it just goes back to how early we have to get up and go out there. You know, I, right. I, I woke up at 3.45 this morning and the last two days, and we're out there, you know, in, in no shade and, uh, you know, until we're done. Right. So that, that's it. But, you know, when we get to set those explosions off, it's it's kind of worth it. <laughs> so we, we saw, and maybe you can tell us if we're going to see it again today, but what we call the wall of fire, and we had some mm -hmm. footage up there of the wall of fire. Can you tell me what that process yeah. looks like? Because it's incredible. I mean, I know for some of our viewers, they have seen this. They, there's the footage there it of it. Yep. What goes into that? So that's my baby. That's <laughs> so your I'm, baby. Oh. I'm the one that shoots it off. Or if we have the, the guests come out, I'm the one that tells them when, when to shoot it off. So that is, we start off with that. That's our main focus in the beginning of the day. So that is 500 gallons of gas in five increments so that's a lot mm -hmm. yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then the timing is just important with all the different you know like yesterday you guys just talked to raz i shut the wall for him yesterday oh so, yep and he, he he was pretty happy with it so <laughs> i uh i don't want to plug myself too hard but i have an awesome video of that i'll, I'll try to share awesome. with you later <laughs> it's on my great. instagram oh <laughs> go okay. check it out i usually go on social media and try to look for all the videos. <laughs> Find all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question for you, will we see the wall of fire today? Yes. Yes, yes. you will. <laughs> That's a great way to make sure that you all stay tuned because it is incredible, both in person, but also captured live for the broadcast. We love it. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I just want to say, we're talking about women in aviation, and that's all aspects of aviation. Can you give a piece of advice on just how to get involved if they're interested in aviation from a pyro standpoint? Yeah, I mean, volunteer, you know, come out, volunteer, and just and learn all the different steps, and, and it's the progressive, you know, just... Uh, Get out there and do it. <laughs> That's excellent. Uh, throughout the weekend, we have been honoring women in Navy, Aval Naval Aviation, now celebrating 50 years since the first eight women received the Wings of Gold. So we're celebrating the past 50 years. We're also uh, celebrating that women have been allowed to fly in combat for the past 30 years. It's not a long history. It's really not that long uh, in, our, in our nation's history. I'm proud of the trailblazers that set the path in motion for me to be here, for us to be here now. I'm grateful. I remember being in high school and seeing very rarely, but occasionally there were articles of these first female naval aviators. And today, you know, we have examples of these great women doing great things in naval aviation, and it's becoming less of a shock, and that is fantastic. We now have generations, plural, of women who will grow up seeing other women fly, 
and how important it is to kind of continue that legacy. We bring so much to Naval Aviation to help keep it going and help to meet the mission and then, uh, you know, be ready for combat. There's really no area that women have not permeated throughout the Navy. Naval aviators are brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers, but we're also very dedicated to what we do. Whether you're the pilot in command or whether you're the work in the mission or whether you're the person helping, you know, your crew, the maintenance side of things, or just everything. And there's there's no limit to our bounce. We honor the generations that came before us that brought about the changes that allow us to be here where we are now. But it's so exciting to think about the changes we haven't even imagined yet. We just have to continue to, to forge ahead and, and continue to redefine what it looks like to be a naval aviator. Being one of the few women going through, I have seen that when we are in these minority groups, whether it's a race, a gender, a ethnicity, uh, that we do need to be that person who reaches back and helps the, helps the others. When you see people that look like you doing the job that you want to do, then you already know that those barriers have been tackled. If you don't, then how do you know it's there unless, you know, we get out there and show that, hey, you know, especially for women, that, hey, women can be naval aviators, so you can achieve this too. I am so excited for the next generation. They have examples in front of them of both men and women who are doing phenomenal things. And inspiration is what drives them to pursue dreams. I would tell, encourage anyone that is pursuing, trying to pursue a career in naval aviation, just to go for it. Don't put a ceiling on yourself. If, if that's your dream, that's your passion, Pursue it with everything that you have. There's always room for more awesome aviators in the Navy, and the more people we have that are interested, the higher quality of our community we can build. Want to say thank you again to Stacy Matthews who joined us here from Firewalkers Pyro. What an incredible interview and to hear about all the booms and speaking of booms and noise, we have some yeah. action taking off. It's happening right behind us. All the uh, FA-18 Super Hornets from Naval Air Station Oceana are getting ready to take off for the air power demo. And uh, man, if you've ever, if you were a fan of the FA-18 Super Hornet, this would be the place to be <laughs> because right here with us uh, on Live Air Show TV, because it is, you're gonna see a whole bunch of them. It's gonna get super loud here as they are on the takeoff roll. And we have had an absolute wonderful time meeting all the men and women of these squadrons. We had a little bit of a tour by uh, one of the members of the, the swordsmen, showed us around a little bit. They are all so proud of what they're doing here for you at home and the rest of the country. And it's so fun to, uh, to watch them take off. As they take off, uh, Brittany, wanna, there's a little tidbit that we learned. Uh, it had to do with the blinking of the lights. You might be able to see them on the tail there. Here's some B-roll of all the uh, different aircraft. So uh, there's the swordsman there, the VF-32. That's the Devotion Squadron. That, uh, that movie is based off a Corsair Squadron back in the day. That same squadron lives on now. And this aircraft here, you can actually see uh, you might be able to see the B-roll has the names of the two gentlemen uh, that were in that incident, that event that the Medal of Honor was uh, given out for. A lot of noise here right now. Lots of noise. Hopefully you can hear some of that in the background as we have our air and power demonstration team taking off. But what a display. This is right on the grounds here. Uh, so you have the opportunity to see what we are seeing and set them up to display the squadron so beautifully. In the background there, you can see their hangars. Each of them has a separate hangar. And at this time, Ryan, I think we're gonna go right up to our military announcer. Oh, it looks like we are on standby right there. Look at, not only do we have the FA-18s, but coming up, we will see Hayden Prophet uh, in the fire truck. Yeah, uh, hot streak. Look at this. Oh yeah, this is the B-52. 
just hanging out on the ramp. That's on the other side Look of the ramp. Look at the size. Gigantic. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm pretty sure this aircraft is called the Instrument of Destruction. Hmm. And I wonder why. Uh, that's <laughs> definitely what it's for. You want to talk about a plane that has had a, a long history of, in service of our country. Uh, that's something that that aircraft might stick around for another 50 years. Uh, really exciting to see. Also, for all the experimental aircraft nerds, uh, a lot of the B-52s still say experimental on the side. Isn't that kinda, great? That's kind of cool. So, yeah, a little bit of a view of everything on the ramp. Here's some of the static displays here at NAS Oceana. There's a ton to do for folks, and if you're watching at home, maybe make a point to come out uh, next year for the show. It would be real good to, good to see in person. It is massive. Just absolutely massive. And a little bit of everything. That's that's the beauty of what we do is we are now turning. We went from the Edge 540, and Melissa is going to be joining us back uh, momentarily, uh, to our jets, the FA-18s, coming up. So right now what they're doing is we had a number of them taking off. They're going to be going through a sequence of demonstrations for us, air-to-air, air-to-surface uh, air demonstrations. So we'll walk you through all of those. Uh, and then we will have the fleet flyby, uh, which is a great opportunity to see them in formation, similar to the blues, just a different paint scheme. And yeah. I don't know that they're 18 inches apart. No, they're probably a little bit, yeah, basically gray and a little spread out. Yes. Yep. But no less impressive. That was actually one of my favorite moments of the show yesterday. You're going to love it today. Really cool. You're also going to see not just the Super Hornet. We'd be remiss if we didn't mention uh, that E2 out in front uh, providing the uh, various air control and radar functionality for the fleet. You can see some of the Hornets now off in the distance. One of the things, too, so we will see the E2 coming back in. They will be a part of the demonstration. And it was really fun. There we go. It was a fun opportunity for me to learn more about the E2. I've seen it, but I have just haven't had the opportunity to see the demonstration uh, at an air show. So for me, this is the first time seeing the E2D uh, that has a crew of five uh, two pilots, three mission systems operators with the option for a co-pilot to act as fourth mission systems operator. And there's so many details with the E2 that, I mean, I was up not as early as Stacy this morning, but I was out <laughs> just scouring the web to find out more of those fun facts because it looks cool. Even on the ramp when you see the E2, and we'll get to it here momentarily, it just looks really cool. It looks super cool. <laughs> and then think about how it needs to kind of fold up to fit on a carrier, too. How'd that go? Fold up. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Doing my best airplane. Because the, the Hornets <laughs> all have wings that kind of boop, pop. The, the wingtips fold up to make right. a little extra room on the carrier deck. But the, the E2 has to kind of, if I'm not mistaken, needs to kind of fold up. <laughs> uh, let me know in the chat if I'm right about that. Anyway, <laughs> we, should talk, we should talk a little bit about the F-18 Super Hornet. That's yes. a, we've been talking about that a lot. We just want to like put it in perspective. These are $67.4 million fighter jets, your fighter jets, uh, if you're from the United States. 60 feet long, 44.9 feet wide at the wingspan, and a weight, a maximum gross weight of 66,000. Now we're going to head up to the booth, the announcer's booth, with Rick Peterson and the announcers from the As well as the Air Air Refueling Probe, on the front of the aircraft. That's an addition for the E-2 Delta. This is going to be our premier surveillance radar aircraft that's going to tell the air wing where the threats are and where to go. Well, examples of, I guess, dogfighting? Right, exactly. So first we're going to see a high aspect merge. That's going to be when two aircraft are going to be uh, going in for a dogfight and are going to be coming in at over 400 miles per hour from the left and the right here. And they're going to try to take out as much the turning room as possible. So in combat, we can expect to see very little gap between the two aircraft. Here for training, we're going to set a 500 foot bubble in between the two aircraft.
So here we're going to see from the left, from VFA 81 Sunliners, Bacon, and on the right, Mr. Tumnus, going to the Burge, setting up for an air-to-air -air dogfight. seeing here as one aircraft maneuvers behind the other into an offensive position to quickly kill the adversary with either the AIM-120 AMRAM, AIM-9 Sidewinder, or the gun. tactics coming up, right? Exactly. We're going to see some more dogfighting coming up here. That was an example of some uh, higher speed dogfighting. We can also see slow speed dogfighting where all of this is going to go down to the deck and you're going to use all your altitude to trade for airspeed here. We'll see our slow speed demo come up next where whoever can maneuver behind the other fighter wins. So in that case, both are going to try to slow down as much as possible and try to employ all of their weapons on the adversary. So here they come, Alex, and they are slowing things down as they approach now, two of them from the left. Exactly. We have two F-18 Foxtrots from the VFA-11 Red Rippers. Going to demonstrate some slow speed reversals in their dogfight. Exactly. It's so aggressive. We saw one fighter maneuver slower than the other and was able to solidly get behind the other one to maintain that offensive position that we just saw there. It looks like he's coming back around again. cued on the other aircraft. Right, I'm, I'm getting 
getting itchy to blow some stuff up. We gotta you know, make some stuff go kaboom. Are we getting there? I'm excited, Rick. I think this is gonna be a fantastic show here. Up next, we've got Pop Attacks coming with two aircraft from the VFA 143 Puke and Dogs. They're gonna be demonstrating a pop here where they're gonna execute a low level ingress to the target yep. and then pop to expose themselves to the enemy surface to air missiles, employ their own weapons, and then egress out of the target area as well. So they're calling them out is what they're doing, and we're going to be listening in. I've got the game way up too high on that. We'll listen into the communications now as we get ready. So here they come, ladies and gentlemen. Dropping down. Up he goes. So the weapons that we can employ from the F-A-18 Super Hornet, we've got laser guided as well as GPS guided bombs. We can also dro drop some dung bombs and cluster bombs as well. There goes a jet from the VFA-11 Red Rippers doing a level laydown employment of some cluster bombs. We're not done yet. Certainly not. Up next, we're going to have an air-to-air -air escort here. This will simulate when a threat aircraft gets close to an area that we want to protect, such as the ship, and we have to launch aircraft with the direction of the E-2D Advanced Hawkeye to intercept and escort them out of our area. So here we have one aircraft that's escorting the E2D that is simulating a threat aircraft with his wingman in trail ready to employ weapons if need be.
Next, we'll be demonstrating a show of force. This will be used when we have bad guys that are shooting at good guys, and we'll look to keep their heads down. We'll come in as fast as possible and as low as possible to scare them and tell who is who in a gunfight. From the left, we'll have a VFA-11 Red Rippers jet demonstrating our show of force to keep bad guy heads down. And up next, we're going to demonstrate what happens when a ground force commander wants to now go lethal and employ the gun in a strafe attack simulating a danger close employment. So here, instead of using bombs, we're going to look to employ the gun in a bunt strafe attack. And from the left, we have two aircraft from the VFA 143 Puget Dogs. Here we have the two Puget Dogs aircraft circling back around to immediately re-attack with an immediate time on target on those ground threats. This allows both aircraft to stay tallied to target and visual any friendlies in the area as they orbit overhead and look to shoot the gun. setting up now to uh, put it all together in this very dramatic is the money shot this is the one that uh, you see so often after the oceana air show where we put the fleet aircraft together the fleet flyby exactly so we've just seen a taste of the air to air and air -to surface weapons and tactics that f-18 super hornets can employ and now we'll get the band back together joining all aircraft from the air wing together they'll assume the call sign tarbox for carrier air wing one 
And the interesting thing about this, formation flying is not easy. The Blue Angels demonstrated in fine style, expert style. But getting back, it's not like you can reach over and touch the brake pedal. You've got an air brake and a speed brake, but it's it's a process, isn't it? It's about angles, trust, and, and getting it in as tightly as possible. Exactly. It takes years of practice to put just a couple jets together, let alone an air wing worth of jet. So they'll take just a few moments to get that done, put it together, and then they'll bring this beautiful formation in, and you'll get a couple of shots, a chance at least, to get some incredible video or stills we hope you share on social media because this is the outstanding shot. Yeah, this is a great opportunity to get a picture for us. We're also going to have all the hooks down from the aircraft as a salute that you'll see as well, so pay close attention. airport on a typical day about 600 operations for 17 squadrons awful lot of people of course 17 total squadrons flying the fa-18 super hornet 15,000 sailors moved around yearly total command workforce of 23,550 service members and this weekend we got come out the chance to thank them all Here they come from the right. Yep, out to the right, we've got an air wing's worth of aircraft coming in for, from Carrier Air Wing 1, call sign Tarbox, with the E2D Advanced Hawkeye in the lead, with jets from VFA 11 Red Rippers, VFA 81 Sunliners, and VFA 143. Who said Sunliners? You said it. <laughs> this is a beautiful shot. Slow motion, too. That way you play it over and over. And then tonight, watch it again on live air show TV. Look at this. The fleet flyby. Look at that as it drifts off to the left. I can't get enough of it. I watch it go to the clouds. There's so many beautiful shots way down there. Look down there. And they got to turn that formation around slowly now, but watch how this happens off to the left. Because if you were doing the math when they took off, well, there were a couple unaccounted for, and that, that's just amazing. Yeah, that was fantastic just to see that last show of force there. Who are some of these people, Alex? Because it's, it's about the people. It's about the human being in there that's pushed themselves physically, academically, to achieve what you've achieved. And... I think the important thing to focus on too when we see so many young people here too is you can do this. That's exactly right. We've all started at the same place and wound up here together in the squadrons at Oceana. Going through our uh, players from today, we had Lieutenant Commander Tim Teddy Nasta with Lieutenant Jack Wee Wee Weekelt in his back seat, as well as Lieutenant Steve Scuba Scoville and Lieutenant Kieran McCarthy, all from the VFA 11 Red Rippers. 
Up next, we're also going to see the recovery of the entire carrier air wing here from the left as they all proceed back in for their landings. This is one of those skills that highlights the skill of a tactical air pilot as well as uh, something we have specific to the Navy. Without having to deal with a pitching deck or do it at night or in the rain at night out in the middle of an ocean. What is that like? Exactly. Well, you, can't, you know, nothing to really <laughs> take the place for the real thing. But up here, we're going to see two aircraft come in for a fan break and execute a carrier landing. So they're at 800 feet with a left-hand brake. That is what's called the carrier brake. We've got another one coming in here for another carrier brake. And then they'll be performing their carrier landings down at the end of the field to the left. two more of them coming in now too for the fan break and then setting up as as though they were landing on a carrier out here in front of us in calm seas today that's exactly right yeah nothing really prepares you for a pitching deck at night but our aviators do it the right time every time as they break overhead the first of our recoveries will be happening to the left tactical demonstration of the Super Hornet coming up later this afternoon along with the Air Force's F-22 Raptor in the next segment. And some incredible aerobatics too and more boom to the zoom. There's so much more to come but we want to recover each and every one of these jets and they'll taxi by and you'll get a close up look at these crew members so that you can again thank them for their service. Right, we're gonna see them come right by in front of us as they pass from the right to the left. Ryan, wow, what an incredible demonstration by Air and Power with the FA-18s. That was something else. A lot of, like uh, Rick Peterson just said, a lot of boom, a lot of zoom. <laughs> and uh, can't, can't tell you how much I enjoyed that. It's really great to see. And again, to see all the different squadrons at this base. I don't think we actually got all of them, but many of the different squadrons at this base showing us what they're made of. So one of the things that we learned while we were here was that the taillights on an F-A-18 blink in a different way depending on what you're looking at. And that was a little Av Geek nerd trivia for me. The first thing that you'll see if you look at a tail that's blinking just once, boop, boop, boop. I guess that's the sound <laughs> that's it makes. The sound. <laughs> that is a legacy hornet. If you see two blinks in a row, boop, boop, that would be a growler. And if it's three times in a row, that is the Super Hornet. And then there's a cool one. What's the cool one, Ryan? <laughs> I was going to let you do the cool oh, one. Oh, OK. So you tell the sequence. All right. So it's boop, boop, boop. And one, two, three. And there are words behind it. It's I have gas. That's right. That's the on carrier tanker. So. The Hornets will actually get loaded up with fuel tanks, and then there'll be a center drop tank looking thing that actually has a bit of a, like a turbine on the front, an air powered turbine, and then that'll provide fuel pressure, and they'll actually have a drogue uh, on a, basically a glorified gas line, right? Yep. That comes out of the back, and they use that drogue to put their probe in on the other side and fuel up. So because when they're out at sea, you can't necessarily count on a large refueling uh, airplane to come out and refuel them. They have to be able to do that, they call it organically, like by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so, because you're looking at all the different hornets in the air, particularly at night, you right. want to know which one has gas, because you need that fast. So you see the one and then the two, so they can clearly see that, ah, I have gas, I need to go to that one. I have to go to the one that has gas. Has gas. 
<laughs> we are giggling over here. Uh, but that is really cool fun facts, and that's what it's all about. We try to capture that information for all of you because we have the opportunity to get up close and personal and talk to the experts, really, as look at them waving again. They are so excited to be a part of the show, waving to the crowd, waving to all of you. They will be taxiing right behind us. This is going to be cool. So it's going to be loud. It's going to be loud. We will probably have you listen in just a little bit, but look at that. Absolutely incredible to see Teddy in the front seat there going by. We heard through the demonstration all of our different pilots and wisdoms as they do a nice parade in front of the show line. Their call signs, you can see Lieutenant Commander, and then their call sign below, which is always cool to see who's in the cockpit. So as they come through, we're gonna give them a wave here from Live Air Show TV. <laughs> a big thumbs up. <laughs> Still to come, we have Rob Holland in his MXS and bringing back Aaron Fitzgerald in the Red Bull helicopter. We'll be right back. John Palenzuela from West Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, what I like about my job is uh, the family aspect. Everybody's just, it's the culture of being a family. Everybody's together. Hi, I'm aviation ordinance man Natalie Colje. I was born and raised in Saginaw, Michigan. And my favorite part about my job is that it takes everybody to do the task at hand, and AO's our family. This is not a test or high school science lab. And it's far more intense than any video game. It's nothing like running for class president, checking in with your friends online, or the first time you got behind the wheel. Out here, it's not where the seat takes you, but who it makes you. Get up to a $40,000 bonus when you start today. advancing with game-changing formulas that promote mental sharpness and help extend lives see what nutrition can do purina pro plan always advancing assurian is more than a tech company we're a company built on care and when you care about something you protect it millions trust assurian to protect their tech but we protect so much more the everyday items, the special purchases, the had to haves, and even the treasured pieces you just couldn't do without. It's our nearly 300 million customers, 19,000 employees, countless products protected, repaired, and replaced that all add up to a whole lot of care. Because if you love it, we'll protect it. What do you champion? Taking up space is really integral to how I move through the world. A pesar de las burlas, de las críticas, I champion inclusivity. Individuality. A better tomorrow, pencil your eye. Champion what moves you.
And we are back here at Naval Air Station Oceana, the master jet base. And man, can't get any more master jet base than that <laughs> air power demo. All the Super Hornets taxiing behind us. It has been one heck of a day, and it's going to continue to be one heck of a day. We have got a lot coming up. We do, we have a lot of action. So we have seen the FA-18s, uh, but coming up, we are going to have the legendary Rob Holland in the MXS. We will welcome back Aaron Fitzgerald and one of our favorites, we were talking about this earlier on, we have the cub sitting next to us that says, Bob's Discount Flying School. Quote, we can teach anyone to fly. And well, we're, we're gonna have- We're gonna see how that we're going to see how that pans out. Take a look right there. Bob's used airplanes. They're just hanging out. So key members of the carrier flight crew is someone called the landing signal officer, also called paddles. And the only school to train the Navy's landing signal signal officers is here at Oceana. So the role of the landing signal officer is to take a look at the totality of the aircraft to include landing gear, flap settings, uh, angle of attack, or the attitude of that aircraft as it approaches the start, which is about 15 to 17 seconds prior to its uh, landing point. Uh, and we're going to assess what the winds are doing, what the deck is doing, uh, whether or not the, uh, the pilot has any sort of issues with that airframe uh, ensure, to ensure that they have a, a stable landing all the way down to the track. Here at the LSO School, we're training the fleet LSOs on how they can do their job appropriately. So uh, there are different classes that we'll instruct. Uh, there's an initial one uh, that we instruct to kind of the fleet, the squadron, the junior paddles um, on their initial tour um, and a mixture of both classroom and uh, simulator training. Um, so in the classroom, we'll give them lectures, we'll show them videos, uh, usually kind of crash videos of previous mishaps of airplanes having uh, issues. Uh, and then we learn from that. And then we will come down here in the sim, and it's a crawl, walk, run uh, type mindset. We'll set them off with gingerly easy stuff, both day, night, and then we'll advance the training as well to get more advanced, obviously. Um, where we give uh, bad weather, um, and then also like malfunctions, uh, not only on the LSO platform that we, we deal with, but then even for the airplanes. Um, so we can see in the simulator how to handle different emergencies and problems uh, before they go to the life. I wanted to specifically train to be an LSO because I wanted to participate in such a cool piece of naval aviation tradition. Uh, since the inception of carrier aviation, there's been LSOs in some variety on the deck helping pilots get aboard and to be able to, um, to, be able to engage in that activity uh, it really makes you feel connected to that through line. Uh, so I really wanted to do that since I learned what they were and what they did. Uh, plus, it is a duty that we stand, uh, and so if you are deployed on the boat, getting to spend your duty day outside, uh, actively helping recover jets, it's a duty day well spent. It's really great because it's a low threat environment where you don't have somebody else's life on the line and you're able to learn, make mistakes, and not ruin a recovery or worse. So we just learned about paddles. Obviously, uh, not on the pitching deck of a aircraft carrier today but uh actually let's talk about the weather for a second amazing it's it's beautiful. just amazing uh really enjoying the day here at nas oceana i wanted to take a minute while we have some time as we gear up for the next part of the air show Brittany, uh i talked about myself a little bit in front of the show but i think people if they don't know you they need to know who you are and what you do uh thank you so much i'm excited to be here i do air show announcing across the world and uh, as I get started, let's talk a little bit more about someone who is just taken to the skies early. The boss cleared him into the box. He's ready to go. More about me later. Stay tuned. Uh, oh, but man. we have a master legend, Mr. Rob Holland in the MX2. Again, we have the chance to talk about him briefly in the beginning. But welcome back to NAS Oceana, sir. We are excited to see you put the MXS to the max. So that's right now, Rob Holland, record setting winner, 11 consecutive US National Aerobatic Champions, five time defending world freestyle aerobatic champion, 12 time US freestyle aerobatic champion, 
honored with the prestigious Art Show Award for showmanship back in 2012. And that's just the beginning of the list. It is. A couple other points that I didn't even know about with Rob was he is also an honorary Blue Angel and an honorary Snowbird. This is someone who uh, started as a young air show fan in New England, earned his pilot's license as a teenager, went up kind of the like, I don't want to call it classic or traditional route, but if you're not going military to learn your flying, uh, the civilian route is one very similar to what Rob Holland did. It says here, uh, you know, flight instructor, ferry pilot, banner towing, commuter pilot, corporate pilot, like all the way up to finally becoming an aerobatic uh, flight instructor and owning a uh, aerobatic flight school. So his goal is always to push the limits of aerobatics. You're going to see that here today. It's going to be intense. The stuff that he does in an aircraft blows my mind every single time. And Brittany, we were talking about you as an air show announcer, so you are uniquely poised to help us understand <laughs> what Rob is doing up there. So Rob is really involved in what we call IAC. It's the International Aerobatic Club, and that is the competition side. So we are part of the International Council of Air Shows, but on the flip side, it's really the foundational piece, as you see right now, going through flipping in the air, now upside down. Look at the precision, though. You will notice his wingtips stopping and then reversing in the other direction. And one of the things that they do is make sure that they are not over-rotated or under-rotated. So you can go through what's called judge's school, and you are trained to go through and view the maneuvers to see if they are on a 45 degree line, if they are going straight, horizontal, if they are doing tumbles like this, uh, are they in control and are they positioned well in what we call our aerobatic box? So you'll see on the vertical right now, rolling, multiple rolls going up. As he goes up, he starts to lose that air power. So you can see he is going on a 45, now flat. He is demonstrating, I believe, some of his rolling turns. Now, a rolling turn is one of the unlimited, as well as advanced, level maneuvers, and it is full control. You have to do rudder, aileron, manage altitude, all while going around in a perfect line, in a circle while going right side up and upside down. Going right over the top, and I believe he's gonna hold it. Hold it inverted as he rolls out and snaps and Ugh. flat rolls all the way down. It just down. makes me so uncomfortable to watch. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part is at an air show, and early on when I first went to air shows, I thought they were just moving the stick everywhere and hitting the rudders and doing everything, but everything that you see Rob doing on the screen right now is controlled, it is calculated, and it's precise. These are all maneuvers that are choreographed out. It's about air management, power management, as well as position. So he definitely knows what he's doing. He's not just having fun flipping around doing whatever he wants. He's not making it up as he goes. <laughs> he is not. I want to talk a little bit about the aircraft. This is something that is rated for plus and minus 14 Gs empty weight of 1,260 pounds. It is a one-of-a-kind aircraft, though. So it's built out of carbon fiber. The MXS is a, like a well-known, uh, popular aerobatic model, but the MXS RH, what are we doing? RH stands for? Rob Holland. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> it's built specifically to his specifications. He's a tall guy, so I, can, I imagine that in addition to tuning it exactly how we wanted, they probably made a little bit of room uh, tuned it to his particular body, right? Just like a F1 car, making sure it's molded just for him. You told me this yesterday, Brittany, rolling at nearly 500 degrees <laughs> per second. It is what I call the snappiness of it. It rolls 
really quick. And that is the precision we talked about with our competition pilots, knowing that world freestyle champion, U.S. national aerobatic champion, uh, they have to make sure that they stop it at the exact point to either do a quarter roll, a half roll, or a full roll, because it is so quick, the airplane will just keep going. Well, it's interesting because when I fly my 172, there's a delay, right? When I take the yoke, and I'm, let's say I'm turning to the left, if I take the yoke and turn it to the right, I actually have to kind of like pre-turn. Muscle it over it. Yeah, muscle it <laughs> over is right, but I also have to kind of pre-turn, right? I have to like anticipate that it's going to take some time to, to roll out on a specific heading. I'm not doing anything inverted in a 172, <laughs> but it almost feels like watching it that when Rob is done with his ailerons, the plane is done immediately. It just, I'm, in, I'm in this exact position that you left me, and that is something super special in an aircraft. So sitting in the cockpit of the MX-2, Rob right now has his right hand on the stick. Um, so his legs are on the rudder pedals, his hand is on his, the right hand is on the stick, his left hand then is on the throttle. Typically too, uh, the thumbs will control either on the stick or on the throttle uh, radio calls and also smoke. So you will notice that right here, perfect timing Rob, thank you for that. He is doing puffs of smoke. This is when he's entering into the second portion. He's climbed up to altitude to let the engine cool down because he certainly puts it through the ringer. And this is his signal to the crowd to say, hey, keep your eye on me, I'm coming back. But throughout the entire time, his right hand is moving the stick, but his left hand is constantly pulling and pushing the power on and off. And there are times on some of the maneuvers, especially with the snaps and the tumbles, that he will actually take his left hand off the throttle, put it on the stick so that he has enough movement to go from his knee to typically the opposite rudder. And it's really fast and it's really quick in order to get the machine to move and do what you need it to do. That cockpit, those controls, again, we're talking about customize exactly to his spe specific, his specific specs, his specific specification. Absolutely. Uh, so it's all about ergonomic control, right, like you just described. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is uh, we saw a little bit about uh, Melissa Burns has a glass per cockpit. Uh, Rob Holland actually does too. That's something that's not super common in aerobatic aircraft yet because they don't necessarily need it, but as pilots are doing more and more cross-country aircraft, and as these avionics systems are getting lighter by going to glass panels as opposed to what we would call in aviation steam gauges, uh, there's no steam inside of them. It's just, <laughs> it's all air pressure and gyroscopes and things like that, uh, but we call them steam gauges. Uh, that's a shift I think you're gonna see more and more. The other piece, too, is it is equipped with uh, fuel systems to do and sustain inverted flight. So this isn't something, again, that's normal, but as you were talking about, uh, you don't do this in the 172. No, and actually, it's very interesting, right? Like, my aircraft uh, has a, 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 it's all gravity-fed fuel. So the fuel is up in the wings, which is above me in a 172 and then it kind of gravity feeds down. So if I were to bank the aircraft, uh, which would not be legal for me actually, if I were to bank that aircraft aerobatically, I would actually, the engine would die because it's not able to maintain fuel pressure. And on this, a lot of times people will ask, how do you get the airplane from show to show? Some people will actually disassemble their aircraft and put them into trucks and transport them that way. Uh, Bob Carlton is one of them. We will hear from him coming up. Rob will have his ferried or fly his aircraft from uh, show to show. So while he's performing right now and when he does aerobatics, the only fuel tank that he is utilizing is the main tank, which is up in front of the cockpit. Uh, otherwise, he does have wing fuel tanks, which are drained. You know why we don't want it sloshing around and we don't need the extra weight so we make sure those are drained or we don't fill them as we travel from air show to air show it's interesting because that aircraft surprisingly can hold a ton of gas 97 gallons 
which is more than, again, I guess we're comparing his ultra high performance aerobatic airplane to my 172 right now. Uh, that's almost actually over double what my 172M basically carries. It's about 40 gallons, uh, give or take, uh, in the tanks on 172. And yeah, it's, it's almost 100 gallons of gas in that aircraft there. Uh, that gives him a range of about six hours. It's a lot of, at the speeds he's going too, that's a right. lot of range. So we've talked a little bit about uh, aerobatic flying and competition flying, but another critical piece is the person, right? Rob's in there and he is dedicated to the safety during all of his performances. He does utilize a custom hooker harness uh, that's a double ratchet system for a secure fit. He is pushing and pulling so many G's during the maneuver, so this helps to keep him safe and secure. There are those booms. I'm not sure if you heard it in my voice, but uh, Rob just created a little bit of some action on the ground with our pyro team, and it caught me off guard. It caught me off guard, too. That's <laughs> A couple other things you will see Rob in a flight suit, uh, as well as a helmet, a Pilot X safety helmet. It's incredibly lightweight. It's a low profile design because again, like you said, he is tall and he fits perfectly snug in that cockpit. And as he hangs hovering above the show line, whew, putting the engine to work on a, a warm day. He's saying to Aaron Fitzgerald, I can do it. Hover. I can hover. <laughs> I'm going to see Aaron up in a few acts here. Uh, these been, we have, I, I'm wondering if you could show, we, we both have one. We don't both need to use them, but we have these beautiful uh, demonstration planes on a stick here. And, going knife uh, edge. Going knife edge. So I'm wondering, Brittany, if you could help me learn a little bit about aerobatics while Rob is giving us a master class. Can you give me the 100 level class? Oh, we'll start with... Maybe in a minute. I will do that momentarily, but we... Oh my gosh, I heard it. I see it. We have Hayden Prophet coming out in hot streak jet truck. What an incredible demonstration here. Take a look on the screen now. We have both on the screen right now, switching to Rob. He's getting set up because we are going, going to see them race. Take a look at Hayden in the truck. This is a truck, Hot Streak 2, can reach speeds of 350 miles an hour or more. It's a twin jet engine, 57 Chevy. Not sure that's exactly what they had in mind back then. Uh, but two Westinghouse J34 engines from a Navy T to a Buckeye jet training aircraft that provide over 25,000 horsepower, 12,500 pounds of thrust when it's an afterburner. And a little bit about our driver, Hayden Prophet. He spent nine years on active duty before pursuing his dream of driving in a race car. And Hayden would like to express his gratitude to military men and women, both current and veterans, for their sacrifices. How incredible. Active duty a serviceman himself coming back to NAS Oceana to race Hot Streak 2 jet truck with Mr. Rob Holland. Rob teasing him a little bit. You can see him coming down, almost playing chicken with Hayden. And I don't know if I would do that. I don't know if I would either. Uh, this is uh, quite possibly the world's fastest pickup. It burns 150 gallons of diesel in a single run. And within the first quarter mile, He's already at 220 miles an hour, which is just bonkers. So we're going to see the classic race, right? All the ab geeks always wonder, car versus plane. You can see that right now. Now, I don't know if it's a totally fair mashup. Uh, Rob's got a little bit more they call smash, right? You can dive in and get a little speed going. But he does not have 
12,500 pounds of thrust. So let's do this before they get set up. We're going to, I want to see what all of you, who you're rooting for. So we have Rob Holland in the MX2, and we have Hayden Profit in Hot Street Jet Truck. Put your comments out there for all of us. If you're Team Holland or Team Profit, Ryan, who are you with today? I'm going to go Team Airplane. I'm going to go Team Rob Holland. Eh, I am all for our veteran. Hayden, don't let me down. Airplane, Let's see, put your comments win. out there. We're getting ready. <laughs> Uh-oh, do we have official word yet? Oh, uh, we might have the chance. This is the beauty of broadcasting and working with Live Air Show TV. We might have the chance to see. Let's take a look. Now, there's my guy. Early lead, not even on camera anymore. But just wait, Hayden is coming in. Okay, Rob is clearly out front. I want to also point out Rob is upside down. Well, it's that hooker harness. So he's upside down. Take a look. Coming in. Oh. Hayden. There we go. Well, what's the finish line? The is the wall, wall of fire. fire. <laughs> Our, all right, let's see those fire emojis coming through right now. I think it was team... Hayden Prophet. No, I just heard streak the producer truck. in our ear just said it was a tie. Oh, good He's job, Rob. Good job. <laughs> Let's give some heart emojis out there for both of them. What a race. And the wall of fire again. What a backdrop. Now, I wonder, and this is something we're going to have to find out, both from Hayden and Rob, what is the impact to them when that wall of fire goes off? Because I know... My husband flies and he was able to race one of the, the jet trucks and he warbled because of the heat and the power coming out from the jet trucks. He actually felt that pressure. So I'm really curious as to how they manage all of that to give us an incredible race. So now that Rob's on the ground, now I wanna, I wanna make sure that I get my aerobatics 101 lesson. 100 level class from you. Look, we have these. It's basically the same thing as what's behind us. We've got a plane on a <laughs> stick. And so could you teach us, for, if we're all learning at home or we're new to air shows, what's maybe one of the first maneuvers we would be able to recognize in the sky? So I'm going to actually show you my favorite aerobatic maneuver. It was the first one that I learned about and I could actually identify in the middle of an air show, and that's a hammerhead. Uh, we heard Aaron talk about it a little bit, or actually, no, Raz talked about the J-turn, a hammerhead. So going in, we'll go this way. Hold on, there we go. Going in, you're gonna pull vertical, and as you go vertical and you start bleeding off airspeed, before you start to go in reverse, you're gonna kick the rudder pedal while maintaining everything going down. Now, the tricky part is, you. Have you done a hammerhead turn before? I've done, I've been a passenger for one. Now tell me your experience with the hammerhead because as you're going up, you almost feel like you're gonna start to go backwards and you just nose over with the rudder pedal, typically to the right or the left, you can go either way. I did it to the left. And as you come over the top, that wing follows and you start building up that airspeed again. And I love it because the smoke that follows creates a little bit of a hammer in the sky. The other one that I need to tell you about because I tried really hard to do it was called a four point hesitation roll. And that's when you come in and you go one, two, inverted, three, and four. It's an aileron roll, right? And you okay. snap it. So using the stick, using the yoke, you go over. Now I thought that was gonna be easy. I thought I would sit in the cockpit. I was in an extra NG. And I thought it would just be one. Well, here's how that operated. I went one. <laughs> and 
and I did not look like Rob Holland at all. Now here's the question though, could you, I want to point out this, like these also do that. <laughs> so what move is that? I guess it's just the takeoff. That's the takeoff. Right? That's the afterburners. And Rob coming behind. Oh, <laughs> clapping. By the way, thank you. <laughs> Thank you to our friends at the Naval Exchange for bringing these over for us. We really appreciate that. We hope we will use them again to help show you a bunch of maneuvers. In the sky now, look, it's our friend Aaron Fitzgerald, again in the Red Bull helicopter. We want to give a special shout out to Nate Burroughs. Thank you so much for being a part of NAS Oceana and Live Air Show TV. Also, we want to give a shout out to Hawkeye Avgeek for watching. Thank you, Hawkeye Avgeek. Appreciate you taking the time to check out the stream today. We're on board now, powered by the Naval Exchange and MWR with Aaron Fitzgerald. The and helicopter he's upside down. going upside down. <laughs> Always having a ton of fun. Now, Aaron does multiple different types of air shows. We are seeing him do his solo demonstration here, but again, being part of the Red Bull teams and Air Force, uh, he will oftentimes take skydivers up with him. Those that are in the, I call them the flying squirrels. The oh, the wing squirrel suits. suits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right as they jump out. And he is also one that you can follow on social media. You can check him out at Aaron Fitzgerald or follow any of the Red Bull teams. And you can see live action from the skydivers. You can watch them step out onto the skid and jump. They will do backflips. It is incredible. We asked Aaron uh, what other helicopters should be added to the Flying Bulls, that's the Red Bull flight team, uh, their collection. And he said he personally would love to see a Sikorsky S58T. I had to Google that. That is an old uh, like Vietnam era uh, helicopter, like transport helicopter, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I saw one at Oshkosh, and I think it was called like the Ugly Angel. So people had a real, real interesting view on what it looked like. The one, the other one he wants to see added to the Flying Bulls collection is the MD-500, which is more of that like little bird, spec ops type bird. I can't blame him for wanting one of those in the collection, but uh, can't go wrong with good old B-0105 that he's flying right now. Learning his aerobatics from Rainer Wilk and Black Schwartz. It's a great honor for him, he said. And, uh, we love seeing that in the air right now. The other thing we often get asked, and many of the pilots do, is are you ever afraid because of the age of the machines? It's not like the vehicles were driving. And he had said, never worried about the age of the machines uh, because there's so much maintenance that goes into ensuring the safety of it. And I think that's a fair point to talk about is oftentimes we will hear, oh, this is a 1964 aircraft. This is a 1952 aircraft. And it is very different than some of our classic cars we see. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even the, the Piper Cub that's sitting next to the booth right now that we showed a little bit earlier that you're gonna see fly a little bit later uh, you know, that's a 1940s design right, right. here. And they're flying just as, as as if it was built yesterday. And Mr. Greg Coons, whew, he certainly flies it. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on to your drinks. <laughs> so Aaron now doing a roll in a helicopter. Again, not a thing you see very often. Really cool to see. He mentioned the G's, right? And he can't pull as aggressive of G's in a helicopter as someone like Rob Holland can, but he can get pretty good pulls and pretty good loops out of it. You'll also see a few negative G maneuvers, and it's just like half a G, so it's mostly like weightless in the seat versus like pulling serious negative G. Right. And Aaron's career, other than airshow pilot, has focused on film and television productions and he's worked on numerous movies and shows and we can see why to have this training 
and the knowledge and the experience is exactly what directors and producers are looking for uh, to get that shot, that image, um, and be able to really work with a knowledgeable expert in the field. In addition to that, like we mentioned earlier, just in case you're tuning in, uh, just for the first time during Aaron's second performance here, he also has experienced flying Blackhawks on firefighting contracts with the Forest Service. So that's a very important job. You can tell that job would also take a lot of skill at the controls. Aaron right now is going through. Look at that shot, Ryan. Incredible as he turns around, nose is down. This is his bow. So he's coming back over and he will come through and provide a bow to the crowd line. Let's take a look. This is perfect footage as he comes around. He's going to turn. He's facing the crowd right now. Now watch for it. Look at that. See, from the cockpit, he can see all of us physically standing on the ground, and he continues to maneuver down. Again, it's all about the fans. Such a gentleman. He is. And for all of our viewers, um, you're seeing the bow right now, but the best thing that you can do is follow us on social media. Follow Aaron Fitzgerald on social media. Uh, he is so great with sharing the images. We've had some pictures with him and he is posting and sharing uh, on his Instagram. And it's just, it's great to see his travels and where he's off to next. So Aaron's getting ready to land again over by the, it's called like the hot section of the airport or the base, I guess it's not an airport, it's a naval base. So the hot section of the base. And uh, while he's putting that down, we're getting ready for the next bit of the air show. Up next, we're going to have some more fun with the Leapfrogs, the Rhino demo team. Greg Koontz is going to fly, Raptor demo, Bob Carlton, and then right behind us, the Blues. We'll be back after this. Child and youth programs. Benefits include childcare discounts, flexible schedules, paid leave, training, and tuition assistance. Apply at NavyLifeMA.com slash CYP jobs. This is your moment. Your moment to dare. Dare to strut. To self-care. Or not care. Dare to turn up. Unwind and try again and again. Because when you dare to live your truth, you dare the world to listen. Try Tide Power Pods with 85% more Tide in every pod. Who needs that much more Tide? He does. <laughs> no, what does that mean? <laughs> it means you're gonna need more Tide. See? More Tide. They're gonna need more Tide. Aw. Who's gonna need more Tide? You are. Yes, you are. Going outside? More Tide. More likes. More Tide. More science. More adorable. More viral. You're all gonna need more Tide. You're gonna need more Tide. It's a mess out there. That's why there's 85% more Tide in every power pod. This is not a game. We're part-time in your uncle's shop. And it's bigger than any state championship. It's nothing like fireworks on the 4th of July, two a days with your varsity football team, or the first time you stayed out all night. Out here, 
It's not where the sea takes you, but who it makes you. Get up to a $40,000 bonus when you start today. Airplanes aren't supposed to do that. And we are back here at Naval Air Station Oceana. We're joined with a very special guest. To my left, I have AO2 Shakara Silas, who's going to answer a little bit of questions, a little bit of questions, some questions <laughs> that we have for her about her time in the Navy. Uh, great to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about your role and what you do? Um, so my original role is aviation ordinance. So what I do is I load missiles, torpedoes, um, sonar buoys, which are submarine trackers. That's what I previously did. And currently I'm a recruiter uh, out of Yorktown. And so pretty much just helping the Navy stay, you know, numbered up and uh, people out there to replace the ones that are leaving or staying in to uh, maintain our, our numbers. I, I have to giggle a little bit before we went on air. Uh, she said, oh, I just load weapons. <laughs> yeah, just and it, I, I was like, and Wait, what? That's <laughs> incredible. Um, it, it's always inspiring to hear what you do, and we hear the acronym, so thank you for explaining AO. Of Appreciate course. that. Of course. Um, so tell me a little bit more about the recruitment. What is, what is, What are some of the struggles that you help to uh, work through with potential recruits? Um, well, we definitely focus on uh, mentally qualified, morally qualified, you know, so those things that uh, when we look at a sailor, what does that look like and what does that sound like, you know, and so we try to stay in that uh, spectrum. So when we have our replacements, they look just like us, you know, they represent the Navy just like us, like we have been doing. What would you say over your career has been your biggest inspiration? Far. Can you repeat the question? What would you say your biggest inspiration has been thus far in your career? Oh, the biggest inspiration, um, my great grandmother. So she recently passed. So, uh, but definitely she taught us hard work, um, passion, and to go for what you want. You know, so she, um, she came from the Bahamas um, and built a life over here for my family. And so watching her do it just shows me that I can do it. You know, and keep on pushing no matter what it is that I want to achieve. Absolutely. So she will 
be my biggest inspiration. And you're leading into it, but we are celebrating 50 years yes. of women in naval aviation. What is your piece of advice? You had it from your great grandmother. Yes. Um, what are you doing for the younger generation and what advice would you have for them? Uh, my role is just really to be that uh, mentor that inspiration when you see me you used to see what the navy represents right and so i try to maintain that wherever i go and uphold the navy's uh, mission statement and what we consider to be you know the flawless navy that we know right <laughs> um but my kind of uh, takeaway would be just keep pushing right um as you see us progress and the navy progress as a whole military progress as a whole just know that you can be that change in the future for something even greater right we have new women can do seals now right so the world is forever changing so i would say keep pushing and stay with what your mission was what is your goal keep that forward because that's going to help you to continue over the course of your career would you say there's a proudest moment that you've had thus far Oh, okay, a proudest moment. I've had a few, you know, I've been really blessed to like have a great career. Uh, so we have a thing we call maturely advanced, which is a promotion without taking the test. Uh, it's saying that you are working above your pay grade uh, earlier on. So we just hand you the pay grade, right? So I've been able to achieve that twice in my career uh, from E3 to E4 and E4 to E5, right, which I am currently. Uh, so that's, I would say the biggest moment in my naval career, just showing me that I have been uh, doing the job to achieve where I'm going and my goals in the Navy to retire hopefully one day. That's incredible. Now I've asked this question a lot of those that have joined us up here, but how do you balance your job, your career, your service with you as a person? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, really? I would say, like, you're always a part of the Navy, right? Those core values that they instill in you, you always, integrity, you know, honesty. Um, but I would say you, you kind of uh, learn how to just have fun no matter what, in the Navy and outside of the Navy. So just taking that, um, really, when you're in the military, when people find out you're military, that's, that, it doesn't matter if you're in uniform or not. So you kind of take it with you. But learning how to uh, spend time with your family and do the things outside of work that, that uh, make you successful or happy, for sure. What's uh, what's next in the career path? You're recruiting for a while. How long yes. does that? How long so, do you do that? Uh, it's coming up on three years, which will end my recruiting tour. And then, what do you hope to do after that? Uh, actually, I just received orders to go to uh, HSM 72 or uh, 72 out in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, where I'll be in Hilo Squadrons. Back to Florida. Yeah, because back to Florida. Where are you originally from? I'm oh, from Miami, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so not too far from home, four hours. So. It'll be awesome. And last message you'd like to share with every, everyone while you're up here with us. Oh, a last message. Uh, just as I repeated before, just definitely like stay focused in your dreams and your mission. Don't let anything or anyone get in the way because you can achieve. We have seen it uh, from uh, pilots to aviation ordinance that wasn't a job back then for women. So uh, just keep striving for what it is that you want to achieve and you can definitely do it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time. You we so appreciate having, having you with us. And Ryan, I think we're going to turn it over. That's right. We're next, we're headed over to the Leapfrogs again up in the sky. There's the mighty helicopter up there getting ready to bail them out the back. So this will be the second time we're seeing the Leap Frogs today. And again, this is the official skydiving and parachute team of the U.S. Navy. They've been doing this since 1969, but were officially commissioned as the Leap Frogs in 1974 by the Chief of Naval Operations. And their mission is to demonstrate Navy excellence throughout the United States. And the team members you're going to see diving through the sky are real world, they all have real world operational experience before joining the Leap Frogs. Just like we heard with our friend here, uh, it's a three year commitment to the Leap Frogs and then they return to their operational units. Now, last time they jumped, they were around 
9,000 feet and taking a look at the cloud clouds right now. Clouds few at 5,000, scattered at 16,000 feet. Our temperature here at NAS Oceana, 82 degrees with humidity at 47%. Our visibility is great, 10 plus miles and the wind south at 12 miles per hour. And we can see that we have the flag up here uh, for our jumpers. But for those of you at home who are able to see kind of our scattered cloud cover, uh, we have a nice warm day and fairly low winds, uh, which is perfect for an air show. And that cloud cover there at 12,000 uh, scattered and few below that uh, should obviously isn't too much of an impediment to the leapfrogs. Sometimes if you have like a thick overcast layer, that could be a thing for civilian parachuting. I'm guessing the Navy will just dive right through the clouds. <laughs> Now, we were talking about the origin, how everything started and the original time frame of the leapfrogs. They began in 1969 with Navy SEALs and underwater demolition team members voluntary, but they were officially commissioned as the leapfrogs in 1974 by the Chief of Naval Operations, and they are starting to come down to the ground. I can hear the crowd cheering them on. Uh, Mr. Rick Peterson, our air show announcer, is getting the crowd hyped up because they are working hard. This is their second jump in the show for us. Yeah, and, uh, yesterday they actually had to do a handful of jumps too. They even had to jump to the beach, which doesn't sound like too much of a drag. Look at that cool stack parachutes right there. And we talked about this briefly. They were going to have a special flag as our jumpers begin to come in. Look at that beautiful flare all the way down. We talked about it before, but the flare, wow, this formation, <laughs> incredible. And here we go, the flag coming in. We're trying to get a good view. The first one coming down to the ground with their emblem, the U.S. Navy leapfrog flag. And we still have the team starting to disassemble above. That means they are at their brief altitude. And they're coming in, and I do believe this is the 9-11 flag that they are paying tribute to the memorial of 9-11 again with our U.S. Navy leapfrogs. We still have two in tandem linked up again, the precision coming down. They are getting closer and closer to the ground and just at the right moment, you will see them break. That was cool. Letting go of the legs, breaking just in time to come in and safely land again. We have about 12 mile per hour winds right now and you can see it on the flag there, adding all the drag. Did feel like we just had a gust that was a bit more than that coming through the uh, announcer desk here, but. And there's the 9-11 flag. We can see the Twin Towers displayed on it. And you can see the drag. Look at, as they maneuver. Wow. And with this wind picking up a little bit, obviously you're gonna start to see, especially with the drag of a large flag like that, they're gonna really have to be mindful of where the wind is going to push them and take them. So on the flag, you could see some of the details that had the twin towers, nine on one of the towers and the number 11 on the other. What a tribute, absolutely incredible. An amazing, fun performance to see so much parachuting today. We've got the leapfrogs twice. We had the EOD jump team as well. And we just had Rob Holland take off behind us. We both paused. We We're heard like, an engine. <laughs> we heard an airplane, airplane. It's Went an air show. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so there go the leapfrogs. And then uh, I think next we've got an MH-53 that launched them is going to do a little bit of a flyby for us.
And then we're kicking it over to some hard hitting action with the Super Hornet. So Ryan, we see the Leapfrogs there, the team, uh, they will gather up the shoots and they repack them right on the grounds. So unlike some of us where we go and have them repacked by a certified rigger, all of them are capable of doing it. You can see the teams grabbing the flags, grabbing their shoots, and they will head back. They will do it right out here on the tarmac and repack all of them to get ready to jump again. And we're going to turn our eyes to the sky as the MH-53 comes by again. The aircraft that took our skydivers all day long up to about 9,000 feet, the MH-53 Sea Dragon, our Sikorsky. Had an opportunity to talk to the pilot, uh, actually both pilots of this Sea Dragon during the brief a couple days ago. And the best part was they were, we were excited about them. <laughs> we were. And they were very excited about Aaron Fitzgerald. <laughs> they really wanted to see and watch and go poke their head into the chopper and see everything about it. So this is an aircraft that does everything from moving troops around to mine sweeping. And uh, it's developed from the CH-53 by adding a third engine and just for fun, a seventh rotor blade. And it's also got those giant sponsons out on either side of it. And those provide substantially greater fuel storage. If that's not enough, seven 300 US gallon ferry tanks being thrown inside the cargo bay. And the flight control system is specifically designed to help tow minesweeping gear. That's interesting. I suppose it's all underneath and to tow it through the water. Uh, it can also be in-flight refueled and can be refueled at a hover, which I bet is a sight to see. And Ryan, our skydivers, correct me if I'm wrong, jump out the back, right? They lower the back. Do they, do they go out the back? I think that, back? yeah, there's a big ramp in the back that right? comes down yes. and they just YOLO out. Which <laughs> at this all right, right now we are going to take a little bit of a breather, but we're gonna pitch it upstairs right now to the Rhino Demonstration United Team. United States Navy, we are proud to present the Rhino Demo Team. The demo flight profile highlights the mobility, versatility, and power of the fleet carrier-based strike fighter aircraft in the world, the F-A-18 Super Hornet, nicknamed the Rhino. The aircraft performing today is the F-Model, the two-seat variant of the Super Hornet. In today's demonstration, Lieutenant Samuel McKilty, also Jai Rani from Afton, Minnesota, and Weapon Systems Officer Lieutenant Jake Broker calls Thumb Thumb the corn fed big head dancing bear. That's not a joke, that is his full call sign. From Newport, Rhode Island. The air crew will experience nearly eight times the force of gravity, accelerate to speeds up to 700 miles, and show the maneuvering craft. Team today will demonstrate abilities being aviators and in combat. Watch as Shirani selects maximum afterburner and rolls the aircraft 360 degrees while cleaning the gear and flaps up, immediately followed by a half Cuban 8. Shirani and Thump Thump, the corn fed big head dancing bear. You are cleared for takeoff.
Hunter with the Superman operator and high angles of attack. Watch as they execute a maximum performance away from the crowd, and even at slow speed, Chirani is able to rotate the nose 180 degrees parallel to the ground. Chirani had dumped on the corn fed big head day with a minimum radius turn to the tail stand. After Burner set a 90 degree angle of bank and hold 7.5 G's for 360 degrees of turn. At the end of the minimum radius turn, watch as Chirani sets a maximum performance pull into the vertical. Negative 2 G pushover to level four. And from the left, this radius turn. setting up for the high speed pass during this maneuver they will run shows 100 feet nearly mock just under 750 miles per hour you may notice the white vapor communicating that it is close to the speed of sound let's see if we can get thumb thumb fed big head dance bear on the radio to see how fast they're going Vertical go center hour. Short fed big into the vertical and push the nose back up on the taking its pop nose and distinctive bug bite. Chirani at the on the corner fed big head Chirani will rapidly reposition the nose four times, flying a square path through the sky.
the The air current now setting up for the inverted whisper pass. Ronnie and Thumped on the corn fed big head dancing mirror front show center. how quiet the aircraft is as it passes in front of you at over 500 miles per hour. Ladies and gentlemen, from the right, the Super Hornet inverted whisper. Dancing Bear are now setting up for the high alpha pass. This maneuver will show you the incredible slow speed handling characteristics of the Super Hornet. Few other aircraft in the world would attempt to maneuver at such a slow speed and high angle of attack. However, the Super Hornet's two digital flight control computers allow it to remain completely controlled while flying at less than 120 miles. Being 
that big head Split S. Shirani and Tuffton. The pitch rate demonstration maneuver to showcase the Super Hornets' excellent pitch authority. With a 90 degree turn and a 40 degree pitch. Gentlemen, as the aircraft approaches from the right, if you're enjoying the performance so far, make some noise for Shy Ronnie and Thump Thumb, the corn fed big head dancing bears. They approach show center. Couple of pedals in this thing, and a left and a right. Which which one's the the, the power? Which one's 
the brake. No, no, sir. That's not how it works. Who's that, and why is he playing with the propeller? This guy oh, looks that's, like... Oh, that's Grandpa. 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 Yeah, don't make him mad. I'm going to tell you what, it'll be a bad day. All right, I'm going to take this thing. Uh, all right, there's not... We've got it. We've got the F-22 coming up next, so we've we've got to get get it out of here. Then, so you're going back behind the hangars. He's gonna he's gonna drive it, as he says, taxi it back over there. They're gonna take the wings off of it, put it on the truck, and get it out of here. And uh, we've got to get a hold of Steve because uh, they're repossessing his airplane. Meanwhile, as he's getting in there, we have the uh, the F-18 coming up. Hey, Grandpa, let him know that the uh, the the F-18's coming up the uh, taxiway here because we've got to give a. Uh, a proper shout out to our team, including the dancing bear. And I saw how he got his call sign last night. It all started to happen. He started hopping around and dancing to the uh, to the band down at the beach blast. So he's going to take this airplane, get it out of here, over to the hangars, get the wings off of it. And anyway, the, the Alabama boys is what they call themselves, repo guys. And this is uh, it's scary is what it is. Let me see if I get some appropriate music to calm us down. There they go. Oh, there's some of that fod I was telling you about. We need to keep that in the uh, in the waste bins and stuff, not out on the runway. Oh, dear, he does think it's a brake pedal, doesn't he? Look at it. No, 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 this is not a good idea. No, 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 just tack to the left, to the left. There, he's got it figured out, I think. Even Grandpa doesn't know what he's doing. There he goes. Oh, you, you can just see there's something wrong there when you look at his eyes. That's just... Not normal. Oh man! All right, he's sorting it out. There we go. Now you're going in the right direction. Not too much power. No, no, we don't need the tip. No, no, not too much power. No, no. Oh no, he's off the ground. This is not. That's not taxiing. That's flying, sort of. Oh no, this is not good. I'll try and get him on the radio. We were so hoping he wouldn't be off the ground. He has no idea what he's doing. Grandpa, does he even fly? They don't know. Trees. Trees are a bad thing. This may end very shortly. There's the trees. Up, pull up, pull up, pull up. Get away. Back on the stick, back on the stick, back on the stick. Oh, man. Up he goes and over he goes. And maybe this will be the last we see of him. I don't, I'm not sure. Even Grandpa's starting to look worried here. He's behind the trees now. That's never a good thing. Here comes our, our F-18 crew. While we try and sort this out, give them a huge wave, including the dancing bear. Oh, Lord, he's headed back this way. And wouldn't you know, we got the fighter plane on the ground. We need it in the air. Maybe we could shoot him down. Up and down this guy goes. I'm going to try and get him on the radio. Sir, are you able to hear me on the radio? Are you able to even communicate? Talking to me? Yeah, not you. Him. The guy in the yellow airplane there. I'm even going to give up on the radio. Hey, Dancing Bear, it's crazy down here. It's crazy out here, too. Saw you busting the moves last night. Oh, always. Well, we can't even communicate with the Alabama boys right now. I'm trying. Perhaps he's got at least the radio on to where he can hear me. He doesn't know how to transmit it. We're trying to talk to him to get it down and get this coordinated right and left, and not brake pedals, but rudder pedals. A little to the left, he just, everything's got to be a lot easier than that. There's the F-22. We'll get it up there to take care of him. As he continues to try and sort it out, I'll tell you, the air boss is a high level. Of so now we're getting him to just calm down a little bit, go a little left, a little bit right. And, and Grandpa, I don't know what we're going to do to get him back down. Trying to communicate with him. So apparently he is listening. And that's a good thing. And we're trying to get him to just be on the inputs with the control stick and the throttle and the rudder pedals and just tell it's way too much for this guy to deal with. So slowly, we can check the power. It might be bumpy in the grass, but at least it'll all come to a stop. One wheel, now the No, we have to coordinate this, not go back up into the sky. Oh, and a little waggle of the tail, because he's figured that out now. All right. Let's see if we can coordinate it in some kind of a landing, sir. I don't know if he's panicking in there or whether he's got it all figured out, but 
Man, if I didn't know any better, I'd say that's a pretty fancy flying. Wait, I think I can hear him screaming. Is that him? It is. He's totally gaslit. He is just absolutely strung. Kind of like my instructor. Grandpa, you're going to have to help. We're going to have to get him down here somehow. I don't care if you land him on the truck and take it back to Alabama with the wings still on it. Let's try and get this done because he's headed our way now. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, I think you got it all figured out now. I hope you didn't panic too much because the guy at the controls is very, very accomplished. His name is Greg Kuntz. Greg playing the role of Clem Cleaver. Grandpa, Tommy Foster, thank you, Tommy. Grandpa's headed back to get the shotgun. I think he really thinks it's happening. Uncle Bob, Robert Duggar, Beaver Cleaver, their son, James Coons. Dog, rat dog, the name, from a man who started flying in 1974, performing in a J-3 Cub for Colonel Monster's Flying Circus. 22,000 flying hours Greg has accomplished. 165 different types of airplanes, instructor, charter pilot, corporate pilot. Runs a bed and breakfast aerobatic school on a private strip in Alabama where you can attend what he calls Sky Country Lodge. Greg specializes in aerobatic courses and upset training. And what he's going to do now after he flies some fancy aerobatics is Grandpa's going to head out with that truck and he's going to land on the pickup truck. You just can't make this stuff up. At least he's going to attempt to land on what has to be the world's shortest runway. So he's got to get it lined up, and Grandpa's deal, he maintain 60 miles an hour. And as they set that up, the very unusual, one-of-a-kind Jet Salto glider is coming out. Bob and Lori, Bob Carlton, the award-winning pilot and designer, and retired rocket scientist, getting ready to take the stage in this remarkable aircraft. We've got to get back on the ground, well, at least on top of the pickup. So Greg's going to get turned around. He has very little time and space to get it settled on the top of the pickup truck. There's just enough room for the two main landing gears and the tail wheel. So he's going to get turned around, and Grandpa's going to hit the pedal, maintain 60 miles an hour, drive as straight as he can so that Greg Kuntz can get the airplane to quit flying right at the right time to sit down securely on the back of that pickup truck. So here is the attempt, ladies and gentlemen, as Grandpa hits the pedal. Greg is lining up and slowly catching up. Dropping down now, sizing it up, getting used to the winds. We got a couple of gusts or so coming. That's not gonna make it easy. He's starting to run out of room already. Now he's got to get a good look at it around the sides of the airplane, hard to see over the nose. And he's going to feel for it to get the main gear on, but no, he's overtaking the truck. That's not good. That's not good at all. He's running out of space in a big way. Now he's got the main gear down. He's got to scoot up. He's got to scoot up to the front. No, he doesn't like that at all. But if I know Greg, he is not going to give up. Do you think he should try that again, folks? Do you think he should try it again? I'm not so sure, but if you are, well, he's all game. So we're going to Grandpa to get turned around again, and let's see if he can get it done this time. That is a beautiful J3 Cub. Greg flies, as I mentioned, over 100 types of airplanes, teaches this upset training in aerobatics, and his uh, Sky Ranch is just a perfect place to go do it. Bed and breakfast, you're treated well, and you're flying every day. How special is that? So here they go again, and they're going to try as Greg gets lined up. Grandpa going straight down the runway, 60 miles an hour. Greg into the wind now. That's going to help him. It's still crosswind situation, though, for the most part. All right, here he comes. The air boss is totally confident with this, as you just heard. There he's got the main gear down. Main gear down and rolling up to the front. Now he's got to get the tail wheel down and convince the airplane to stop flying. And they've got to do that just right. The truck has to slow down with him. Tail's still up, so that means the wing still wants to fly. Slowly, it settles down now right at show center. 
I think they've done it, ladies and gentlemen. A huge wave to Greg Coots and this spectacular pickup truck landing, ladies and gentlemen. Grandpa's part in it as well. It doesn't get any better than that. But also now you've got the uh-oh moment because, uh, well, they can't go back to Alabama like that, can they? He's got to take off again. And that's going to be teamwork, too. But I think first he's going to give you a little closer look at this amazing thing because I just noticed he's he shut the, the dang plum engine off now, and he's got to get that restarted. He started performing in 1974 in a J3 Cup. This very one, in fact. In the Flying Circus, now 165 different types of airplanes that he has flown. Grandpa, still pretty agile, isn't he? Getting up there, making sure that the uh, wheels are secured on the airplane now so that there's no gusts blow him off the truck after all that work. Oh, here he comes. And you'll uh, be sure and give him a wave for all of his, his insanity. We just love working with Greg. And you're going to see it in his eyes. There is crazy written all over this guy. And uh, and yet, very accomplished and award-winning pilot. We're happy to have him here at Oceana. And as Greg dri drives by now, <laughs> not taxis, drives by <laughs> on the truck there. We can see him just over the show center line coming in in that J3 Cub up on top of the truck. We are getting ready for a few more super intense, super exciting acts. We've got the Raptor demo getting ready to depart. And then Bob Carlton in that jet glider, the Jet Super Salto, then we'll have a little bit of a break and then we'll be back with your U.S. Navy Blue Angels to finish out the weekend. It's always incredible to see Greg because he's such an accomplished pilot. He's an instructor and to see him fly so uncoordinated and act as a bad pilot <laughs> really has to be a ton of work and we have Fred in the truck as our grandpa. They are giving everyone a huge wave. You can see live right now to the cockpit. He's jamming along. The music is going with the Alabama boys. He's bopping his head. <laughs> Absolutely love it. And as they taxi back out to the runway, you can see him start his prop right now. So they will be launching off the truck. So he landed on it, but he's not done. There is more to the show. So they're heading out right now towards the taxiway in front of them. We have Bob and Lori Carlton with the Super Salto. And in just almost 45 minutes, we will have the finale of the NAS Oceana 2020. 23 air show with the U.S. Navy Blue Angels. So I've just got word that the Raptor is on the move. Get, get ready for some heat and some excitement. But also exciting is this. The J3 <laughs> taking off of the truck because uh, that, that's actually a technique that sailplane, or not sailplane, sorry, float planes use. Once the uh, wi winter's over, you gotta get it off the, the grass. You throw it on a trailer. You do. Fly off into the sunset. As we Wait for clearance from boss. Again, we're doing multiple fog checks along the way, making sure everything is safe. And here we go. Mr. Greg Coons, the truck is rolling. You can see 
and pull back on the stick level out in the beautiful J3 Cub. And he is airborne. He is launched. And I'm guessing he's just going <laughs> to fly it all, all the way down to the hangar and land it. Probably. Yeah. He could. Uh, oh, he's I, already touching down, I think. <laughs> he is coming down. We'll get him clear of the runway. And then we are getting ready to turn things over to the F-22 demonstration team. Before, if you didn't have a chance, check out the video later on. We had the opportunity to go live to the cockpit with Raz. And at this time, we're turning it over. Here's the F-22 demonstration team. Combat Command, we welcome you to today's F-22 demonstration. I am F-22 demonstration team superintendent, Master Sergeant John Lugo from Tempe, Arizona. As a proud member of Air Combat Command's first fighter wing, located at Joint Base Langley Eustis in Hampton, is my distinct pleasure to describe for you today. A capability demonstration. The advanced Dell's fighter operation is it supports now. operate in the in your F technical Brian for Island Chief Sasser Bird Pencil Sergeant Clairsville Beyond Airman Shan A Sergeant L for Forney Officer Rich F twenty Technic North and Kyle Nicky twenty demo with over eight in port and Samuel uh, about to wavering capability of the most advanced and most lethal fighter aircraft in your United States Air Force. The F-22 you will see today is an unmodified and fully combat-capable aircraft. While we can't show you everything that makes the Raptor the most lethal fighter aircraft in the world, we will show you its raw power and thrust vector maneuvering capability as it executes maneuvers that no other combat-ready fighter aircraft in the world can perform. As today's demonstration begins from the right, You'll see the Raptor execute a maximum power takeoff, producing 70,000 pounds of thrust from its powerful F-119 engines. The Raptor will virtually leap off the runway in an amazing 1,000 feet. In the climb, Captain Larson will push the nose over and accelerate forward. So now, now it is time to stand up, move forward, and get ready. The show is about to begin. advanced flight controls combined with its powerful engines allow the F-22 to pull more than nine times the force of gravity. 
Watch from the right as the Raptor demonstrates its tight turn capability with a minimum radius horizontal turn and then powers straight up into the vertical. Then watch as Captain Larson changes his direction with the amazing J-turn reposition. Firepower of the Raptor comes in any combination of eight missiles and up to eight precision satellite guided bombs. The F 22 is the first supersonic, multi role, and highly stealth fighter in the world with the fully internal combat weapons load. Ready your cameras as the Raptor banks in from the left and cycles its weapons bay doors. to dedicate this next pass to the men and women of the armed forces and their families who support them. We would also like to remember our wounded warriors and veterans in attendance. This great nation. This will be your best photo opportunity, so get your cameras ready to capture this salute. Now, from behind and to the right, the F-22 Raptor proudly presents the dedication pass. F-22 possesses the ability to point its nose at even at extremely low air speeds and high angles of attack. Watch closely as the aircraft pulls into the vertical and next 160 degree aileron roll. At altitude, the jet will then flip backwards and level off. Then, in less than 2,000 feet of altitude and under complete control, Captain Larson will execute a full 360 degree flat turn. As it executes the power loop, you'll see why the aircraft is unmatched in a vertical fight. As it powers through a loop and doubles its altitude at the end. At the top of the loop, you'll see why the aircraft is unmatched in a vertical fight. 
you'll see the raptor rotate around one spot in the sky, utilizing the vector thrust of two powerful engines, which will literally flip the aircraft through the vertical and back to level flight. Many jets can turn tight, many jets can roll quickly, and many jets can climb fast. But not many can hide. Watch now from behind as the Raptor flies over, pulls straight into the vertical, and brings his throttles to near idle. And then, under complete control, the F-22 Raptor will actually slide backwards. Slow speed handling characteristics are phenomenal. Watch now as Captain Larson repositions the aircraft to crowd right, reduces the power, slowing the Raptor down to less than 90 knots, and loads up on a high angle of attack. After the pass, you'll once again feel the raw power of the jet as Captain Larson lights those afterburners and climbs straight up into the vertical. Ladies and gentlemen, from the right, the Raptor's slow speed pass. The F-22 possesses the capability to reach speeds and altitudes that make it virtually untouchable, even without using its afterburners. Accelerating from 90 knots to over 600 knots, Captain Larson will now roll inverted in preparation for a split-S reposition and a high-speed pass, showcasing just a fraction of the aircraft's super cruise and full-speed capability. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare for Freedom's Thunder on the high-speed pass. The F-22 will now set up to perform a Hoover pitch. This maneuver is a double knife edge, separated by an inverted tuck, followed by a pitch to line up in preparation for some zoomy passes. This will be another great opportunity to capture the Raptor on your camera during our demonstration. Ladies and gentlemen, named after the late legendary Bob Hoover, the Raptor's Hoover pitch.
Ladies and gentlemen, coming in from behind and overhead, the F-22 Raptor with the hot pass Cobra Strike. Ladies and gentlemen, repositioning from the right, the F-22 Raptor with the tactical pitch and firewall. Ladies and gentlemen, the Raptor inbound from the left with the tactical pitch to pedal turn. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's demonstration. We hope you've enjoyed this brief display of only a fraction of the F-22's full combat capability. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at F-22 Demo Team. On behalf of the United States Air Force, the Commander of Air Combat Command, General Mark Kelly, and all the men and women of Air Combat Command, thank you for your attendance, thank you for your patriotism, and thank you for your support. Raptors out! Watching the F-22 coming in for a landing now. And, man, I don't know. Ooh, I like that one a lot. <laughs> and the wall of fire. Uh, again, what a privilege and an honor to talk to Raz Samuel Larson. Absolutely incredible. And to see the stealth, the maneuverability. Absolutely an incredible demonstration as we watch Raz touchdown in the f-22 raptor what was your favorite maneuver watching i yesterday for some reason the tactical pitch got me mm -hmm. going a little bit today i think it was the cobra i was gonna say the same thing yeah the cobra really got me from especially here from our desk basically flew right overhead and then you just get blasted in the face by the afterburners which was super cool and the tight radius turn too. It's always incredible to me how they will go around and do a circle right in front. Every time I think they're not gonna close the circle, they're not gonna, and they do it every time. Such a tight turn and we are just 
23 and a half minutes away from going into the U.S. Navy Blue Angels, but we still have more to come sandwiched in between our jets and our jets. We have a different kind of jet coming up. That's right. We're going from big jet to little jet. <laughs> to Big Jet. Bob Carlton is up next. There we see him on board, again, powered by Naval Exchange and MWR. And uh, yeah, he's he's squeezed in there all right. That's a tiny, tiny thing. And uh, we're going to watch him do some amazing things in that comparably tiny thing. And sailplanes, though, let me put this in perspective for you. Compared to, we keep talking about my 172, uh, big wings, long wings to make them fly that efficiently. And we see, see Lori on the, the wing right now. Again, the glider, the jet sailplane. Lori, crew chief. Again, it takes a team effort. Bob's inside concentrating. We will talk to you more about him as Lori's on the wing. He's calling her in hold. And look at the hand signals. Again, this is a team effort because he's in their headsets on. Boss is in his ear. Uh, Lori also has a headset on, too. Uh, with comms, but we have the F-22 Raptor taxiing back in. So we want to make sure that boss is coordinating everything. And there we go. Lori is starting to run. You see her behind Bob. That means he is officially launching as we have the F-22 exit the runway. And so most sailplanes can't do this. They can't self-launch. Most of them are towed into the sky with either a tow plane or a winch. But a select few have motors that can be pulled out. The Super Salto has that leveled up even further with a jet engine on top. Ryan, have you ever been in a glider before? I have. You have, me too. It's amazing. It's, um, I imagine Bob's isn't like this, but I was always just astonished by how quiet it is without the motor running up front. It really is. And to see the aerobatics that Bob does in the, the jet sailplane, the Super Salto. Again, Bob, you saw the clip introing him, and he looks like a mad scientist. He really is a retired rocket scientist. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> rocket scientist goes, oh, I like flying sailplanes. I like rockets and jets. I'm just going to, oops, I got my sailplane in my jet, or my jet and my sailplane. So Bob is joining us with his wife, Lori, from New Mexico. A uh, family man. They have two incredible dogs, Ginger and Dewey. And Bob has been doing this for over 40 years, Ryan. How, how cool is that? 40 years. Yeah, 40 years of flying under his belt, and in that history, he's got a 2017 Art Scholl Showmanship Award by ICAST, 2016 Chairman's Award winner, and a 2015 Bill Barber Award for Showmanship as well, presented by EAA. And the showmanship, I have to talk about this a little bit because we have the privilege of seeing Bob Carlton perform during the day but he also is an air show performer at night. And his crew chief, Lori, that we saw running, running in a little bit of heat today, holding the wing up, also helps to load all the pyro on the jet sailplane. And you can see right now we have some smoke, which helps us to see the grace. I told him last night we had described him as very graceful in the sky and he said that's that's a perfect thing to say yeah, he's like that sounds right also you could use the word ballet ballet sky ballet oh i love seeing that onboard image right now and you can see ryan right above bob's head that's the jet correct yes that is the jet engine it's by a company called pbs It's a company out of the Czech Republic. They make the TJ100 jet engine that powers Bob's Super Salto. It's a fully computer controlled and operated engine. It weighs 40 pounds and puts out an incredible 240 pounds of thrust. Think about that. It's, I don't know, what would you say? About the size of a microwave? Maybe a little bit smaller? 
It is. I mean, when you stand on the ground, the super salto probably comes up to your waist, your chest weight, waist area. So it's not that big, but big, beautiful, graceful glider wings. And you can see Bob tracking right now up and over. You can see actually by his harnesses in there how he floats up out of the seat. The straps hold him in. This is my favorite part of the broadcasting is for us to see live in the cockpit with Bob just concentrating and watching. You can see the straps float up and down. So you almost have that feeling at home of what Bob is experiencing. I like watching how calm and focused he is. And this type of flying, you know, I love it. it it's an interesting position in the show, right? We've gone from super maneuverability to ballet in the sky. And right there, I don't know if you saw it, if our audience saw it, he just performed a four point hesitation roll in the seal plane. And he did it far more gracefully than I did the first time. <laughs> Absolutely, like, super gracefully. This is the type of flying that I, I think, when I watch Bob Carlton fly, I think about how, when I'm dreaming about flying, like what my dream is, mm -hmm. it's more like this. And you can see his smoke transitioned. He first started with it on the wingtips, now transitioned to the tail. So we have a different perspective of the aerobatic maneuvers that he's performing. You can see the wings flexing under the G load. Look at the outer edges of the wings on either side of them there. A little bit of turbulence too. That's all totally normal. Sailplanes are built to flex like that. That's incredible to see. From our perspective, we can't see the flexing of the wings, but this onboard footage is absolutely dynamic. We see him switch his smoke again. So now we have the red smoke. And we are going to see a little bit more action from Bob as he performs the aerobatic maneuvers. This is Bob's second jet sailplane, and he is constantly innovating, experimenting, and I believe we may next year see the jet sailplane, not with one jet, Ryan, but with two. That is gonna be pretty cool to see. It's gonna be great. It's a good thing we have a rocket scientist piloting and putting together new ideas to bring to airshow audiences across the world. So Bob spent a lot of time in flying contraptions. He also flies hang gliders, powered planes, helicopters. He's dropped a hang glider from a balloon at 13,000 feet the year <laughs> I was born, back, back in 1982. He's flown a hang glider for over 100 miles. Think about that. No no engine on a hang glider. 100 miles in a hang glider. Over 200 miles in a sailplane without an engine on it. That's a long way to go with no thrust. And Bob's not just tied to the jet sailplane that we have the privilege of seeing today. He has over 2,000 hours in various aircrafts, including hang gliders, airplanes, helicopters, and of course, sailplanes. And looking back at his air show history too, and I'd love to find this in the archives somewhere like he's flown barnstorming biplane acts, kind of that <laughs> classic air show act. Uh, helicopter sailplane toes. I'm not even sure how that works. So I have to go look up that. That sounds really amazing. Now we talked about how we transport aircraft from air show to air show. This is one where it's trailered. So after the air show at NAS Oceana, you will see Bob and Lori get to.
to work and taking apart the jet sail plate. And what they'll do is they will put it in the trailer and then they are off to their next show. So every time they are working at disassembling the jet sail plane, but they're also doing pyro every single time. So the smoke has to be loaded. The pyro, if there's a night show, has to be um, done as well. Uh, so it's a constant team effort to bring this type of act to our audiences. By the way, he's going pretty fast out there. We've seen speeds up to 175 miles an hour today from Bob. So right now we see Bob Carlton coming in, beautiful cockpit footage right now as he lands. What you'll notice too is he's gonna come down and pretty soon he's touching down and he's looking straight ahead at Lori that is in the truck because they're going to hook up the plane and trailer it or tow it, I should say, tow it back to the hangar. So momentarily here we have Lori standing out on the runway already. At nighttime, she will actually have a flashlight that's flashing so that when he lands, because it's pitch black, uh, he can see exactly where she is and how much uh, momentum he needs in order to get to her. Because as he gets up and he loses that forward momentum, a wingtip's gonna drop. So Lori's going to be there. We saw her just there momentarily to come over and he is watching. Coming closer, they usually do this right next to a taxiway because the truck is located there so they can walk the sailplane over to the tow bar, get it hooked up, and again, tow it back to the hangar. What a, what a great show, a routine yeah. demonstration in between from the Raptor to the jet sailplane. <laughs> So much fun here, Edo. And I think it's really him just keep it balanced on those two. Actually just have the one main gear and a tailwheel, uh, if that. Sometimes they just have skids, and so he's going to just keep it up. And you can see Lori right there. Oh, perfect. Just going to grab right onto the wing and now help him taxi out of the way without dropping that wing, like you mentioned. So we talked to them a little bit last night, and what you can't really see is that it's a little bit of a downward slope. So he has to stay on the brakes, but he can only do so much. So we're gonna watch. Sometimes Lori has to run along <laughs> to keep the momentum because Bob can only have so much control on the brakes. It looks like they are managing it well. We're Lori's holding is the pyro. What an incredible show. And right now, Ryan, I think we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in a minute.
Resilience. Stability. Work-life balance. Connecting with sales in the fleet. Pride. It's rewarding. Focuses on diversity and inclusion. Working alongside other veterans. The benefits. Welcome back to the 2023 NAS Oceana Air Show Women in Naval Aviation, anchored by the Navy Exchange and MWR. And we are back, and you know, we've got the Blue Angels behind us. They're going to do a whole bunch of maneuvers. Four point breaks, the half cube, and all a few minutes to talk to them about what their favorite maneuvers are. I would say my favorite diamond maneuver is the double farble. It's extremely challenging to get right on your parameters. And then as soon as you do that, and now we're starting over and trying to get back on parameter. So, uh, the double farble is definitely my favorite diamond maneuver. The double farble is, uh, is an awesome maneuver. Again, what Boss said, it's very hard to set up. And then, you know, me and Amanda slide out, and then you see Boss flip inverted. Now Boss is flying inverted, trying to keep us stable. And then Jamami's crazy. You know, Scott's crazy because he's not only flying inverted, but he's flying formation inverted. Definitely the double farvel for me. I think it's uh, it's something that you only do in the Blue Angels and in the four spot. I'd say that's the one that most people who are doing backseat rides, that's the first time they really start freaking out in the back. So Boss and I will both flip inverted, and then I will drive in, and I'll be flying inverted, inverted formation off of, uh, off of Boss's jet. We're talking about 18 inches of separation between uh, my canopy to the bottom of his jet. Uh, you're kind of staring right down the APU exhaust, which is on the bottom of the jet, not an angle that you see very often when you're flying F-18s, um, and it's just pretty incredible. You're hanging in your straps, negative, negative 1G uh, for about 20 to 25 seconds, and then a little negative push out, 270 degree roll, and then a canopy roll around the three jet to slide back into the diamond position so it, it takes a lot of practice it's definitely not something you feel comfortable doing right off the bat but uh something you you know you work on a lot you build a little more confidence uh within the diamond and then you get to a point where it's a it's a pretty pretty awesome maneuver to execute Ladies and gentlemen, it is now our honor to bring to the set from the Rhino demonstration team Ryan Garcia call sign Peaches welcome Good to be back. <laughs> I feel like a regular on the show now. You are. Uh, one of the things I have to tell the audience is that this was your last air show as a demonstration pilot. Tell me what that experience was like for you. Kind of as I alluded to yesterday, it's a little bittersweet. This, today is the last day. I'm the Rhino Demo Coordinator for one more shot, so I get to tell my guys what to do uh, for about two more hours until the show's done. Uh, but honestly, like... Um, Family-wise, it's, uh, it's more of a sweet moment because I get to spend more time with them, more time on the weekends uh, to go back. So uh, I will miss it, though, because I had a ton of fun. I got to meet a lot of friends around here, uh, especially this show. Uh, I met you here last year, which was great. I met you here this year. I'm sure we're going to be lifelong friends, too. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a big dog, Marshall. I got to call him out, too. He is awesome. Uh, I do want to say you mentioned it, family man. Tell us a little bit about Ryan. All right, a little bit about Ryan. So Ryan started off as Peaches in the fleet. Now Ryan is uh, two Peaches. We have little Peaches. She came to the show. It's her first air show. Our daughter Catalina Joe Garcia, little Katie Joe, is three and a half months. Uh, she came down to see me fly. She slept for the whole thing, but I know she felt it in here. <laughs> and that is so great. Um, one of the things I have to ask is, what is it like to be a part of the Rhino demo team? I'm sure you saw it, but... We were talking about Wizzo Dancing Bear right in the back, and he came back and he was just rocking and dancing. Tell me about the team dynamics that you experienced. So that's what we look in when we find new team members. Anybody that comes to the squadron wants to try out, we look at like personability first and foremost, because a lot of the stuff we can learn through our syllabus, we can teach them how to fly the profile. It's just how well they can connect with people. Dancing Bear is one of my favorites, uh, obviously, and I love the rest of the guys too. Don't get me wrong, Grouse, <laughs> Popo, Shirani, those are great guys. I actually deployed to Shirani. Um, and I don't know if you guys remember Spud, his last show was in Langley this year. Uh, he's actually the godfather to my daughter. Uh, oh, so wow. basically lifelong friends. We make family out here. Oh, that's incredible. So I want to go back to, you know, you've had a pretty amazing career thus far. Uh, if I had advice for anybody wanting to follow in your footsteps, what would you tell them? Come find me. 
please talk. Talk to somebody who's ahead of you because if you talk to somebody that's doing what you want to do, you have a little bit better guidance than someone who doesn't know anything about it. Um, and then never lose that mentality. Never lose the drive to keep going because, as I said yesterday, you're going to have a 1,000 people tell you no. And it just takes one person to say yes to give you that motivation if you don't have it internally. Um, but finding that one person that will support you no matter what, that's a huge help. For me, that's my wife back there. Um, all the hard times I had in flight school and the fleet, going on deployment, she was always there by my side. So, um, And she's way smarter than me. So. I want to I want to point that out. Way smarter than me. She's awesome. Hopefully, I can be a stay-at-home mom one day. I don't know if she heard you over there. She <laughs> would so, say really she'll know. loud. <laughs> so we're gonna try, you guys. It doesn't happen often. It's but a three and a half month baby on you, TV. This is about family and friends, ladies and gentlemen. Take a look. Pages, introduce us to your beautiful family. Oh, she's not loving it. That might not Doesn't be like the limelight. It. That's fine. This is my wife, Barbara. Barbara. Barbara Garcia and Catalina Joe Garcia. Thank you so much. He <laughs> talked about your support and love. We'll let you take care of her. First time on live air show TV. This is a first all the way around. This is what we love doing. Um, Ryan, first, I need a fun fact. I know the story, but peaches. Tell me about peaches. Well, there are children watching, so I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> It's because I'm soft and I bruise easily. So we'll keep that on record as well. <laughs> That's great. It's always fun to know, and sometimes we get the stories, and sometimes sometimes we don't. We First get of all, a Peach's song just came out. Jack Black sang that. We played it here on the sands, and it was amazing. So good time to be a Peaches right now. That's right. Wanted to go. We just saw a little package just before you walked up about the Blue Angels' favorite maneuver, the double farvel. Uh, what's your favorite maneuver of your demo? So yesterday I alluded to the uh, flat pirouette that we do. Um, after thinking about it some time, uh, fav my favorite thing to do on deployment is fly around the ship, fly around the boat, doing the carry break. So the carry break here into the low transition where basically we just pick the nose up just off the ground slightly, ease that upward pressure, and then we throw the gear up and the flaps up and accelerate as fast as we can down the line uh, as low as we can. Our limit is 50 feet. That's what we go for a minimum. Um, but that is the most fun because um, you go in from 400 knots, break over, and then before you know it, you're touching down, and then you're shooting back off again. Thank you so much Absolutely. for Thank joining for us me. today. we got to go over to the Blues. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you. So, you. so we are headed behind us. The Blues kick it off. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Your United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron takes pleasure in performing for you this, our 47th flight demonstration of the 2023 season. I'm Lieutenant Commander Thomas Zimmerman, narrator for the Blue Angels. Since 1946, the Blue Angels have had the unique privilege of demonstrating to the American public the precision techniques of naval aviation, hoping to inspire a culture of excellence and service to country. The maneuvers you will see demonstrated here this afternoon are coordinated tactical techniques developed by Navy and Marine Corps pilots in both peacetime training and actual combat. These maneuvers are neither stunts nor daring feats, but are refinements of the basic techniques taught to every prospective naval aviator. Here at Naval Air Station Oceana, we will demonstrate these maneuvers at very low altitude in traditional Blue Angel formation so that you may see 
And take pride in the precise fashion in which your Navy and Marine Corps pilots train to fly. Now, direct your attention to the ramp before you. Observe the military manner in which the six demonstration pilots approach their aircraft and are saluted by their crew chiefs. Ladies and gentlemen, Flying Blue Angel number one, the commanding officer and flight leader of the Blue Angels from Skinny Atlas, New York, Commander Alex Armitas. Flying Blue Angel number two, the right wingman from Yorktown, Virginia, Lieutenant Commander Chris Kapishansky. Flying Blue Angel number three, the left wingman from Moundsview, Minnesota, Lieutenant Commander Amanda Lee. Flying Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot from San Francisco, California, Lieutenant Commander Scott Goosens. Flying Blue Angel number five, the lead solo from Woodlawn, Tennessee, Lieutenant Commander Julius Spratton. Flying Blue Angel number six, the opposing solo from Madison, Wisconsin, Lieutenant Commander Griffin Stangle. As the crew chiefs assist the pilots into their jets, you are witnessing the teamwork found in all Navy and Marine Corps units. The Blue Angels take a great deal of pride in personifying the Navy and Marine Corps values of honor, courage, and commitment. For more information on our support crew and our pilots, we invite you to follow the team on social media, including Facebook and Instagram. There you'll find exclusive photos and videos, as well as a behind the scenes look at our organization and how we operate. The Navy's Flight Demonstration Squadron, the Blue Angels, is the oldest performing U.S. military aviation demonstration team. Since 1946, the Blue Angels have brought naval aviation to men and women of all ages across America. We were first based at Naval Air Station Jacksonville, Florida, flying F-6 F Hellcats. We continued flying Grumman Corporation aircraft for 22 years transitioning in late 1946 to the more powerful and faster F-8F Bearcat. In 1950, we transitioned to jet aircraft with the straight-wing F-9F-2 Panther, predecessor of the swept-wing F-9F-8 Cougar, which we received in 1955. In 1957, the Blue Angels became equipped with high-performance aircraft with the arrival of the supersonic F-11F Tiger. In 1969, we received the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom and flew this supersonic jet until 1974 when we transitioned to the A-4 Skyhawk. In 1987, we acquired the F-18 Hornet and demonstrated its reliability over 34 show seasons. We are now in our third year of flying the combat-proven Boeing F-A-18 Super Hornet. The pilots and crew chiefs will now start the general electric engines that power the F-18. The noise level will soon become too high for you to hear a description of the checks they will be performing. 
However, please note that each aircraft was carefully inspected by expert Blue Angel maintenance personnel prior to this afternoon's aerial demonstration. The Blue Angels fly the Boeing F-A-18 Super Hornet, a multi-mission strike fighter, versions of which have been operational throughout the fleet since 2001.
The Blue Angels, taxi in tight formation, just as you will see them perform here this afternoon. This degree of precision has been a trademark of the Blue Angels since first established 77 years ago. 16 officers and 127 enlisted personnel comprise the Navy's flight demonstration squadron. Pilots one through showcasing the precision flying required of Navy and Marine Corps aviators, while pilots five and six fly as solos demonstrating the maximum performance capability of the aircraft. Once again, I'm Lieutenant Commander Thomas Zimmerman from Baltimore, Maryland. Blue Angel number seven, the narrator for the flight demonstration, as well as the pilot for the key influencer and media personnel we normally fight each show site. Blue Angel number eight, Lieutenant Commander Brian Vaught from Englewood, Colorado, is the squadron naval flight officer and events coordinator. Commander John Fay from Fort Worth, Texas, serves as the squadron executive officer. Our Marine Corps C-130 pilots are Captain Jackson Strife from Omaha, Nebraska, Major Joshua Sultan from Spokane, Washington, and Captain Sam Pecco from Osceola, Indiana. Lieutenant Commander Henry Cedeno, our maintenance officer from Juana Diaz, Puerto Rico, is responsible for the men, women, and equipment that keep our aircraft flying. From Cary, North Carolina, our assistant maintenance officer is Lieutenant Commander Greg Jones. From Williamsburg, Virginia, the Blue Angel flight surgeon is Lieutenant Philippe Warren. From Scottsdale, Arizona, our supply officer is Lieutenant Paul Kruger. Our Boeing technical representatives are Mr. Jack Ralph from Fort Worth, Texas, Mr. Todd Lawson from Tigard, Oregon, and Mr. Landy Harnishfeger from Nantucket, Massachusetts. Our financial management analyst is Ms. Deborah Johnson from Pensacola, Florida, and our administrative representative is Mr. Aries Wilkins from Columbia, South Carolina. The six demonstration pilots are approaching the end of the runway to begin their takeoff sequence. Very shortly, Commander Armitas will call for the four diamond pilots to take fingertip formation. In this formation, Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot, will be positioned outboard of Blue Angel number two on the right wing. From there, they'll initiate their takeoff roll, transition to the diamond on liftoff, and commence the diamond burner go low transition on takeoff. As the diamond clears the flight line, the two solo pilots will begin their takeoff maneuvers in a dynamic display of the thrust produced by these general electric engines. Lieutenant Commander Bratton will roll Blue Angel number five 360 degrees immediately after takeoff with the landing gear still extended. Simultaneously, Lieutenant Commander Stengel and Blue Angel number six will execute a precise low transition, pull the nose straight up and complete the maneuver with a half loop also known as an Immelman, as he exits the flight line inverted to the right. They're on the runway now, establishing fingertip formation. They'll accelerate their engines to 85% power, carefully check their engine instruments and give Commander Armitas a thumbs up, indicating they are ready to go. With a signal from each of his wingmen, Commander Armitas will call for the selection of afterburner and the Blue Angel Diamond will initiate this afternoon's aerial demonstration. Accelerating to 150 miles per hour, he'll pull back on the stick, flying the formation into the air. Immediately after liftoff, Lieutenant Commander Goosens will call for the landing gear and flaps to come up and they'll execute the Diamond half squirrel cage on takeoff. We're clear for takeoff. Winds are calm. Check your parking brake off. Check your trip set. Check your news. Let's hear out. Maneuver. Dive and have two minute breakout. Left turn out. He's on. Do I mean Cruise on bond was fired up from Virginia Beach? Now, to the left, Commander Armitage calls smoke on. Off brakes now, burners ready now, and the Blue Angel Diamond will shortly be rolling. As they pass before you, you will notice the smoke is no longer visible while the engines are an afterburner.
The smoke comes on as Commander Armitas calls for the deselection of Afterburner. Pulling through the horizon, he'll roll the formation 180 degrees to the upright position, completing the half Cuban 8. As the diamond accelerates the descent, they'll exit the flight line to the left. To the right, Blue Angels 5 and 6 are rolling. Blue Angel number 5 will complete the dirty roll on takeoff, while Blue Angel number 6 executes a precise low transition and pitches up vertically at 6 times the force of gravity. The Blue Angel Diamond will momentarily be making its approach from the right. In relatively slow speed flight, they will give you an opportunity to get a close look at the precision flying that produces the 18 inch wingtip to canopy separation between these four aircraft. From the right, the Blue Angel Diamond! The sensation of weightlessness, herbalistic flight, similar to that experienced by astronauts in space, will now be felt by the two solo pilots. Approaching center point, Lieutenant Commander Bratton and Lieutenant Commander Stengel will roll their aircraft to 90 degrees angle bank and push forward on the stick as they perform the opposing knife edge pass. The diamond are maneuverly familiar to you, who angels poked from the 400 miles per hour, the diamond roll. All four aircraft flying as one in this graceful 360 degree rolling maneuver. Crack. 
The two solo pilots will next demonstrate the inverted flight capability of the F-18. Approaching inverted from the left and right, they will roll their aircraft 360 degrees crossing over center point. Ladies and gentlemen, the opposing inverted to inverted roll. To the left, the diamond is setting up for their next maneuver. Appro Approaching center point on Commander Armitas's command, all four pilots will simultaneously roll their aircraft 360 degrees as they perform the diamond aileron roll. Here's Commander Armitas. Aircraft pilots and enthusiasts who appreciate the difficulties associated with carrier aviation will enjoy this next maneuver demonstrated by the two solo pilots. To the right, Lieutenant Commander Braddon and Lieutenant Commander Stengel will establish a mirror image formation. However, look closely as both aircraft are in the carrier landing configuration as they approach for a maneuver we call the Fortis. For Navy and Marine Corps pilots who must land their aircraft on the small and sometimes pitching deck of an aircraft carrier at sea, slow speed flight is just as important as high speed flight. In order to demonstrate the dirty slow speed handling characteristics of the F-18, Commander Armitas has called for the extension of landing gear and tail hooks by the four Diamond pilots as they execute a maneuver that is performed by no other jet demonstration team in the world today. From the left, the diamond dirty roll. To the left, Lieutenant Commander Bratton is approaching to demonstrate the maximum performance turn rate of the F-18. He'll execute a 7.5G after burning turn and exit the flight line vertically, showcasing the Super Hornet's turbo nose low capability.
diamond pilots approach once in a while, you should notice two significant modifications. Having rolled their aircraft 270 degrees and crossed with minimum separation, observe as both pilots sustain six times the force of gravity to cross their aircraft over show center. The four diamond pilots are now stacked down and aft on a 45 degree bearing line to establish a right echelon formation. From the right, at 378 miles per hour, the Blue Angel Echelon Parade. Setting up for their next maneuver, Blue Angels 5 and 6 are converging on center point to demonstrate the rapid roll rate of the F-18's fly-by-wire flight control system. Crossing center point, they'll complete two consecutive rolls, totaling 720 degrees with a combined closure rate of over 800 miles per hour. Ladies and gentlemen, the opposing horizontal rolls.
as they exit to the right, you will notice that the entire formation has smoothly shifted back into the Blue Angel Diamond. To the right, Lieutenant Commander Bratton has joined the Diamond in a line of breast formation. Still maintaining minimum separation, the pilots must now align themselves by looking 90 degrees from their flight path towards Commander Armitas' aircraft. They'll climb up through vertical under heavy G as they perform the very difficult five plane line of breast loop. As they exit to the left, Commander Armitas calls for another formation change prior to detaching Blue Angel number five. You have seen several flight profiles of the F-18. The two solo pilots will next demonstrate precision roll rate control. Approaching center point, they'll roll their aircraft 360 degrees, pausing after each 90 degrees of rotation, crossing center point in the inverted position. Ladies and gentlemen, the opposing four point hesitation roll.
still pull up through vertical, roll the formation 90 degrees, and perform a split S, finishing with a dynamic separation maneuver. As the formation pulls to level, each pilot will perform an individual brake turn and exit the flight line in a separate direction. The Blue Angel Barrel Roll Brake! To the right, the two solo pilots are making their approach to the flight line. Approaching center point, they will simultaneously roll their aircraft 420 degrees in section. Ladies and gentlemen, the double tuck over roll. From behind the crowd, Commander Armitas is rolling out the diamond formation for another dynamic maneuver, the low brake cross. Approaching center point, each pilot will perform an individual brake turn and exit the flight line in a separate direction. individual smoke trails as all four aircraft converge on center point with maximum closure and minimum separation. Stangle are approaching to demonstrate the slow speed, handling characteristics of the Super Hornet in the clean configuration. They'll pass before you, virtually standing Blue Angels 5 and 6 in their tails. 
At less than 120 miles per hour, the fly-by-wire flight controls provide the slow-speed handling that sets the Super Hornet apart in the air-to-air -air combat arena. Ladies and gentlemen, the section high off the pass. calls for the selection of afterburner by the four diamond pilots. As they pass over center point, you will hear and feel the thunder of eight engines producing 168,000 pounds of thrust. The Blue Angels, home based in Pensacola, Florida, completed an intensive winter training period at Naval Air Facility El Centro, California. The beautiful weather of the Imperial Valley provided us with the optimum conditions to fly each of the demonstration pilots on the 120 training flights necessary prior to our first public demonstration. Our show season opened on the 11th of March and runs through early November. The Blue Angels will perform 65 flight demonstrations this season while visiting 32 cities throughout the United States and Canada. The next portion of our flight demonstration will showcase all six aircraft flying together in formation. The Blue Angel Delta has been our signature six plane formation since 1958. Behind the crowd to the right, the two solo pilots are joining the Diamond to form the Blue Angel Delta. From the right, at 400 miles per hour, the Delta roll. All five wingmen maintaining position as they roll 360 degrees over center point.
as they exit to the left. Observe as Commander Armitas brings the formation back towards the flight line. Very shortly, all six aircraft will be approaching for the Blue Angel Florida Lee. In an aerial salute to our four deployed forces, all six aircraft will separate, perform individual 360 degree rolls, and the four diamond pilots will rendezvous through a looping maneuver. From the left, at 450 miles per hour, the Blue Angel Florida Lee. Let's listen in. Exit the flight line to the right. Observe as Commander Armitas executes a reversal turn, rolling out the formation for the Delta Loop Break Cross. Armitas calls, smoke on, ready to break. As each aircraft accelerates to 500 miles per hour, they will perform a half cube eight reversal turn. As they pull up over the top, you should be able to follow their individual smoke trails as all six pilots simultaneously roll their aircraft 180 degrees and head back towards show center. From six different directions, with maximum closure and minimum separation, they will converge on center point and cross with a combined closure rate of nearly 1,000 miles per hour.
For a description of our maneuvers, as well as an in-depth look at our team and individual biographies, we invite you to visit our website and follow us on social media, including Facebook and Instagram. In front of the crowd, the Delta is making its approach to the flight line. Approaching center point, the entire formation will separate in dramatic fashion. Ladies and gentlemen, the Blue Angel Delta Breakout. Ladies and gentlemen, your United States Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron represents a time-honored tradition of pride, professionalism, and excellence spanning 112 years of naval aviation. The 2023 team takes a great deal of pride in saluting Navy and Marine Corps aviators, maintenance crews, and support personnel everywhere. From the left, your 2023 Blue Angels. One of the unique demands placed upon naval aviators is that they be able to land their aircraft on a ship at sea. Whether it be a tactical jet, propeller-driven aircraft, or helicopter, each requires skill which the naval aviator must master. In order to perfect this skill, Navy and Marine Corps pilots spend a great deal of time in the landing pattern practicing carrier approaches. In front of you now, Commander Armitas and his wingmen are demonstrating a simulated carrier pattern. Approaching the runway from the left, Commander Armitas is confirming the landing checks have been completed and that each aircraft is in fact ready to land. Rolling out on final, they'll make constant power and lineup corrections, maintaining the optimum rate of descent for the proper touchdown point.
The demonstration pilots you've been watching perform here this afternoon are but a small part of the Blue Angel team. The men and women in the blue uniforms standing before you are members of the elite Blue Angel maintenance crew. Through hard work, many long hours, and unselfish dedication, they have each year for the past 77 years provided us with the aircraft availability necessary to perform each of these flight demonstrations. As the aircraft taxi back, I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you the Blue Angel maintenance crew. Command Master Chief Matt Dawson from Racine, Wisconsin, Maintenance Master Chief Riviera, California, Maintenance Chiefs Carolina Barrio from Armenia, Columbia, Columbia, and Gregory Ogle from Newport News, Virginia, Crew Coordinator Tanner Bales from Meredith, New Hampshire, Crew Chief Number One Jeremy Bloom from Nashville, Tennessee, First Mech Paint Shop West Tetmeyer from Dayton, Ohio, Crew Chief Number Two Alex Gutierrez from San Antonio, Texas. First Mech Life Support, Darren Johnson from Spanish Fort, Alabama. Crew Chief number three, Chelsea Roberson from Jacksonville, Florida. First Mech Life Support, Casey Smith from Phoenix, Arizona. Crew Chief number four, Leon Grant from Fayetteville, North Carolina. First Mech Airframes, Cody Farrell from Long Island, New York. Crew Chief number five, Yinda Michael from Lagos, Nigeria. First Mech Power Plants, Jose Cruz from Corpus Christi, Texas. Crew Chief number six, Rachel Luckett from Detroit, Michigan. First Mech Power Plants, Austin Adcock from Longview, Texas. Crew Chief number seven, Cameron Tuzon from San Diego, California. Runway Truck Alert Crew, Sam Smith from Virginia Beach, Virginia. Cyrus Brown from Antelope, California. Josh Watson from Maryville, Tennessee. Matthew Rowe from Harbor City, California. And Ross Alexander from Somerville, Georgia. Quality Assurance Representative, Moises Mercado from Oceanside, California. Aerospace Medicine Technician, Aaron Lewis from Newport News, Virginia. Public Affairs Representative, Cody Decio from Yakima, Washington. Video Technicians, Nicholas Kaminsky from Mount Airy, Maryland, and Hugh Wynn from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Logistics Support Representative, Kristen Turner from Forside, Maine, and Chris McAvroy from Rising Sun, Maryland. Maintenance Control Representative, Kaylee Williams from Winchester, Virginia. Music choreographer Yvonne Renteria from El Paso, Texas. C-130 crew Matthew Thompson from Woodstock, Georgia. Peyton Lopez from Abilene, Texas. Lauren Song from Aurora, Colorado. And Russell Fink from Canton, Ohio. Maintenance support personnel John Miller from Lakeview, South Carolina. Joshua Boone from Roanoke, Virginia. And John Russell from Montgomery, Alabama. Ladies and gentlemen, your 2023 Blue Angel maintenance crew. Taxiing just off to your right, the Blue Angels will momentarily be turning into the parking area. After completing a short maintenance debrief, the team will come to the crowd line where you'll have an opportunity to meet them. As they step away from their aircraft, I'd like to take one final opportunity to introduce the demonstration pilots you've been watching perform here this afternoon.
having secured their engines, the pilots will simultaneously exit their aircraft on a signal from Commander Armitas. It has been an honor and our pleasure to perform for you here at Naval Air Station Oceana. This, our 47th flight demonstration of the 2023 season. Ladies and gentlemen, Flying Blue Angel number six, the opposing solo from Madison, Wisconsin, Lieutenant Commander Griffin Stangle. Flying Blue Angel number five, the lead solo from Woodlawn, Tennessee, Lieutenant Commander Julius Braddon. Flying Blue Angel number four, the slot pilot from San Francisco, California, Lieutenant Commander Scott Goosens. Flying Blue Angel number three, the left wingman from Moundsview, Minnesota, Lieutenant Commander Amanda Lee. Flying Blue Angel number two, the right wingman from Yorktown, Virginia, Lieutenant Commander Chris Kapashansky. Flying Blue Angel number one, the commanding officer and flight leader of the Blue Angels from Skinny Atlas, New York, Commander Alex Armitas. Ladies and gentlemen, representing your United States Navy and Marine Corps, the 2023 Blue Angels. And that was something else, Brittany. <sighs> Man, love watching the Blue Angels fly, and it gets me every time. The 2023 NAS Oceana is coming to a close, and what an incredible air show celebrating 50 years of women in naval aviation. It was really a great one, and uh, all of us actually here at Live Air Show TV, we want to acknowledge the end of an era happening on the other side of the country right now. It is actually the very last air races at Reno right now, and after we wrap up today, we'd invite you to go tune into their broadcast to witness an end of an era in aviation history. Now, on behalf of all of us here with Live Air Show TV, a special thank you to our officers, the staff, the incredible directors that have been here, all of those that we've interviewed, our performers and the spectators. To our sailors and Marines, thank you so much for your service as well as your hospitality. This is the end. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Brittany Nielsen. It has been an honor. It has been a privilege broadcasting to you, announcing for you at home here from NAS Oceana. And I am Ryan Dombrowski. And yes, what a weekend. We can't wait to see you next time. Thanks for watching.